morning. How are you? Morning. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and get started with the Santa Cruz Metro Transit District regular meeting for June 28th. And can we uh, begin with the roll call, please? Like, uh, Director Bothwar. Here. Director uh, Kaufman Gomez. Present. Director Gonzalez. Present. Director Leopold. Here. Director Lind. <clears throat> Director Matthews. Here. Director Myers. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Pegler. Here. Director Rothwell. Here. Director Rutkin. Here. Ex officio Director Northcutt. Ex officio Director Preston. Here. Yeah, Corm. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to announce that our uh, inter Spanish interpreter today is Mindy Esqueda. Can Mindy uh, come up and give us a little uh, introduction right now? Thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Mindy Esqueda. I'm the Spanish interpreter today. If I can be of assistance, please let me know. Buenos dias, soy Mindy Esqueda. Uh, estoy aquí para ofrecer servicios a traducir en español. Si les puedo ayudar, este, por, por favor, este, véanme ahí, voy a estar atrás. Gracias. Thank you, Mindy. I'd also like to announce that uh, this meeting is being televised by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Our technician today is Mr. Lynn Dutton. Um, with that, uh, it's time for Board of Director comments. Are there any comments by members of the Board of Directors? Matthews. Yes, I just want to let the board know that at our last city council meeting in Santa Cruz, we uh, voted a contract amendment to, to complete the final 5% of design on the Highway 19 uh, interchange improvement. It's, you all know, that's the worst interchange in, in the city. And it also directly affects uh, metro operations in terms of people getting to work, buses getting in and out, and so forth. So I wanted to let you know that we did approve that final 5% for design. But also, the, as you all know, I'm sure this intersection um, is a controversial issue every single time it comes forward for action. So I wanted to, A, let you know that we're moving forward on that. Um, but also suggest uh, and request that we, we could perhaps have something come back from staff so there'd be kind of a standing support for the improvements at this intersection from Metro. There's a direct correlation. CEO got that message yeah. and acknowledges we, we've that. We've spoken. Oh, yeah. good. Okay, great. That's good news. Yeah, uh, the, uh, we're going to hear some more uh, from reports from our uh, consultants from Washington, D.C. and the state yeah. today, I know, but... Uh, there's one issue that really is having a profound impact on uh, Santa Cruz County roads, and that's the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, usually they gave you extend. We, we suffered half the damages in the uh, 16, 17 storms of the whole state of California in this county. And uh, we've got a, a bill of about $35 million. And there was a timeline that you could get your preparations done for this work two years, and the, the policy of the past was that you could extend it for six years. Uh, this administration now, uh, federal administration, has cut that, said we're not going to go six years. You've either got to do it in two or you're not going to get it. It's impossible uh, with to get everything together in that short amount of time. Um, and it could have a cost of uh, $35 million worth of repairs that are needed in this county. Uh, it's going to have an impact of uh, over $5 million for Santa Cruz County. We are covering that for work that we've already done that we are anticipating getting federal funds from. Uh, but we, uh, uh, it's, it's really going to be a <coughs> severe blow. And the reason I mention it is, of course, because our transit, uh, our buses go on the county roads all the time. Um, and it's going to be have a huge <coughs> uh, negative impact on our budgeting that we're going to really feel next year. We're feeling it this year, but it's going to be for uh, with $35 million worth of repairs that we're going to have to find a way to cover. So uh, I just want to let anybody know, I, I, I want to let everybody know that, that our Congress members, in particular Eshoo and Panetta and many others uh, throughout California have said, uh, listen, natural disasters, we know this administration doesn't like California very much, but na natural disasters happen everywhere. And uh, uh, they hit us really hard. and. Uh, it's going to be a severe blow to us uh, in our budgeting process, but uh, I think the people should be aware of it. And if you um, can make a contact with any member of Congress or anybody that you know in this uh, federal administration, please do so, because we're going to need all the help we can get to make this uh, be part of it, and we'll probably hear a little more about it a little later. 
Thank you for that update. Any other director's comments? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the mural at the Watsonville Metro Center. Yeah. It, it is complete. It came out really nice. Uh, the muralist Paul D. and Jaime Sanchez finished it up, and they've started on the next section of the mural, the, the new section, and uh, we hope to get that going on and, and complete it too by the end of the year. That's great news. Thanks for that update. Any other comments? Okay, we'll uh, move on to uh, uh, oral communications. This is a time when uh, people from the public are allowed to come up and speak on any item that is not on the agenda. Is there anybody who would like to speak to us today? Yeah, come on up. Yeah, I'm the only one? Oh. Well, we'll see. Okay, so Keith Otto, a 20-year county resident. I'm here because I support Metro and I hope to see it uh, flourish and expand. Um, for those, <laughs> thank you very much. I wasn't even here to complain about anything. <laughs> and I got the buzzer. Okay, give him an extra five minutes. Go <laughs> ahead, Mr. O Go ahead, Mr. Otto. Right, Sorry, I want to stop. You. All right. <laughs> All right. I should have played with it before. Yeah. Well, hey, so that gives me the opportunity to state again that I'm here because I support Metro and I hope to see it flourish and expand. For those that are in the mid or south county and they want to come to Santa Cruz, right, that becomes a much more workable service with an express bus situation and a HOV lane. I look forward to that coming online. Um, I've got some reservations with regards to the shoulder program, but we'll see how that, uh, that fares. Yesterday at the RTC meeting, many of you were there, uh, there was a gentleman that spoke um, disappointed that there's no longer bus service in La Selva, that it was dis discontinued back in 2016. You know, I understand those are tough decisions. I have seen those near empty buses. At the time, the community put forth a suggestion for smaller buses um, to these lower ridership areas, and the idea was to save money and to save the service. And in discussions with the county and whatnot, it was explained that that's not really a cost savings. Every time you have to spin something up that's different, there's actually additional cost to have something that's different. And with regards to the items that are going on with RTC and services and items that they're pondering, right? I'll share a comment that I stated yesterday. Um, this was from the county uh, public works, uh, person affili affiliated with the county public works. You know, he said, if we're not taking care of what we already have, but rather creating more stuff, that we're not sure how we're going to take care of in the future, we think that is the wrong way to go. So I would exercise uh, uh, that approach with regards to making the solutions we have more robust and workable um, and prioritizing that over expanding um, into other things that might be hard to maintain and take care of in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate those. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Carl Sigmund. I live at 725 Bay Street. It's a senior housing, and I'm really happy to be a uh, citizen of uh, living here in Santa Cruz. Uh, I am using the bus system a great deal now, and uh, I have nothing but, I mean, mostly, I have nothing to say but very high compliments for it, particularly the drivers. They have a lot of responsibility. They are, show a lot of, of, of uh, attention to people, and they've got, I think they're great, and I think they do a great job, and I'm overall very happy with the system. I'm calling, I wanted to ask consideration for this matter of the 31-day card, which you call it. This card, my, I'll get to my bottom line, and I hope that you'll have it expire at midnight instead of the way it works. When I charge this card, and I have the 31 days paid, and I may wait a day or two and try and stretch it out. I don't know if any of you are on a fixed income. I don't think you are. But in any event, when you are, you'll understand this. And the bottom line is I try and stretch it out as much as I can. But if I, when I go to the bus and use it the first time, it's going to print the time that I signed on. So where I live, if I want to come inbound, my first bus is at 8 a.m. If I put this at 8 a.m., it's going to expire 31 days later at 8 a.m. Or God forbid, if the bus gets there a little early, it's 7.59. And I'm not going to be, you know, technically the bus driver could say it's expired. And I don't want to have that discussion, bottom line. That's what it is. I could give you the details, but bottom line is, I would hope you'd consider to be able to have this card expire at midnight. That way you'd have that whole day. 
and I wouldn't have to wait till like five in the evening when I'm able to use it and then make it around, and then I have that next period of time until five o'clock. So that's what I was hoping that you'd consider making that change. And the other thing I want to just say is that the clock system downtown is something that you really need to address. Uh, I look at those clocks and I wonder if they're just not, uh, you know, they're too old. I'm not sure why you don't keep the time right. But you don't, you got to appreciate how important that is as a, like the symbol of how you run. You run on a schedule. And when those clocks are wrong, and you don't realize some of the little subtle stuff. You can run up there and think you're there on time, and the bus left five minutes early, and you don't know. So in any event, that's something that really is important, I think, to address, to have that running right. Okay? Thank you for your opportunity. Thank, thank you for those comments. I, I think what you're trying to say is that if we're going to go ahead and do a 31-day pass, it can be a 31-and-a-half-day pass, and it's really well, not going to bother anybody. I, I, I appreciate your points. No, I, I, down to the 30 minute, 30 seconds. I, 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 you I, know, I thought about, I thought about actually the financial impact that it might have here, because it, but the bottom line is the person that's going to get have to pay that little extra is going to be the guy that doesn't have it, you know. And the fact, I mean, I'm not saying you have a lot. I, I can only imagine what kind of budgetary issues you have, but just it's a small item. It's something that could, I think could be done without a lot of infrastructure uh, changes and so forth. I know there's printing and stuff like that, but just to Thank I don't you. Know how to Thank do you it. for the perspective. We Thank appreciate you. it. Okay. Great. Next speaker, please. Morning. Morning. Um, I just want to get my nervousness out of the way. I'm really nervous. Uh, so take your time. Public speaking is not my, okay. my strong okay. point, so if you can bear with me with my sure. stuttering and my I'm going blank. Um, what I want to address this morning is um, my name is Mario Espinoza. I've been in bus driver for 34 years, and all the time I've been here, I come to work every day. I rarely call in sick. I can't remember the last time I called in sick. But the reason I'm here today is I'm advocating for my son, Corey Espinoza. He got hired on March 27th, only to be terminated 10 weeks later by Anna Gavea, our operations manager. Now, I feel that this was discrimination, and I'll tell you why. My son, when he submitted his, his application, he accepted it. If he went in, after that, he went on to pass a video test, driver's video test that you have to pass before you go to the interview. He went to the interview. He passed the interview. Anna handpicked him and said he was good. So he got hired from Anna. She picked him. After that, he passed the written test, the MV written test, which is not an easy test to, to, uh, to pass. You have to uh, really study. Ask any other bus drivers here. You have to really study for him. Anyway, after that, he moved on with Leo to train him to pass the, the driving skills test, which you go up to Mountain View and to get your, your driver's license in order to drive a bus, which is all fine. Leo was with my son for eight weeks, one-on-one -on -one training, because four other drivers, there was five in his class, and four of the drivers in his class called in sick, so it was just one-on-one -on -one training. And all this time, Leo did not say one bad comment about my son. He came to work every day, he, was, he did what he was told, not one bad mark. And on, in addition to that, he went to line instructing, which is a final step before going on to being a bus driver. And I have letters here that I hope he can read, pass on to you, that, that there's no bad marks on him. Nothing, not one. And on top of that, on a second day of line instructing, he got a commendation from one of the passengers because he defused a situation that, um, that, could, you know, that could have escalated to something serious because a passenger got on the bus with a concealed weapon, and my son spotted it. And he, he, def he defused the situation. So I have that letter of combination here, too, if you could please look at it. Um, there is no other reason I can think of. The only reason that, that Anna told them, my son, that he was fired, he called him into his office that one day and told him, you are not qualified to be a bus driver. That was pretty vague. There's no other reason. I asked Anna what was the other reason, but she, I thought she said, she said, talk to HR. I went to HR, they gave me the runaround. They didn't want to talk to me. They kept pointing to me with somebody else. So. Um, I can't think of a, re a valid reason for my son to be fired, to be determined he did everything. He just wants a fair shot. He wants a fair chance this. He wants a second chance. He deserves a second chance. Every bus driver here has gotten a second chance. And for him to be fired, it seems like just on being a good driver. Thank you. Then Go ahead and finish your story. Thank you. For him, to, he's, to me, he's being fired for being a good driver, coming to work every day. 
That's what it is, because there is no valid reason. There is nothing there. If you can please check with the line instructors, with Leo Pena, he's a safety uh, coordinator, excuse me, at work, you won't find one bad mark on him. Nobody said anything bad about him. His coworkers are here, and I want to thank my coworkers for coming here to support my son and the union, John, especially John and, and um, Brandon. Okay. And um, so I hope I'm pleading with you, and I'm asking you, please, if you can make this right and give my son a second chance. We'll but obviously take a look at it. Thank you for coming you. up and, and presenting that story. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. board so to touch on Mario's story is I got the run around trying to get some answers for Corey and they couldn't even give him some answers when he called them to ask him directly why did I not qualify and the only thing we saw was that he had a medical emergency that was around a holiday and it was a day after a two a couple days after that holiday where he had that medical emergency and and uh, he had a call in sick the very next day, he was terminated. And he has proof that he was in the emergency room with his emergency receipt, or emergency room receipt. And when they brought him in, they didn't even ask for an explanation, nothing. And that really concerns us because we're having trouble recruiting and retaining employees. You know, we're having to pick up the slack of being understaffed. And if we actually get those trainees to come through and actually finish training and then we just let them go during line instruction right before they're about to get sent out, that's very concerning for us. And uh, we have a petition here signed by 143 people that believe Corey Espinosa needs to be returned to work. And we just ask you guys to review, review the situation and give us an answer, please. Thank you. Great, thank you for that information. Uh, is there anybody else who'd like to speak to us at uh, oral communication? Okay, we'll go ahead and close oral communication. Uh, we have a written communication from the MAC. We have a representative from the MAC. No, nothing from the MAC today. Yeah, she has a report on the uh, on the uh, on the agenda. Okay, all right. That uh, that comes later in the agenda. That's right. Okay, um, labor organization communication. Anybody from labor like to speak to us? I don't know who the speaker is, okay. I look. Welcome. Thank you. My name's Olivia Martinez. I'm the SAU staff representative, and I've been with the union now for 10 years. And I'm here today because I have some really concerns about what's going on at the table for SEIU. Two years ago, we were approached by Mr. Clifford to do a compensation study in order for us to extend our contract. He wanted the compensation study. We did the compensation, they did the compensation study, and you guys all know the issues with the compensation study, right? We have worked very, very hard in good faith with management to come to some agreement with the compensation study, and we did. This proposal, this economic proposal, his bargaining team has proposed the same the last three times. We have moved drastically at the table while we have proposed 16 proposals, they have proposed 60 proposals. We have TA'd the majority of their proposals in good faith. Yesterday, I told their bargaining team, I'm willing to stay here up until 2 a.m. in order to have an agreement. We were, because we have the majority of the TAs, this is really the only pending issue what we saw from his team is that he is not allowing the team to move. He is keeping in bad faith this proposal. This proposal is a disrespect to our workers. It does not give anything to our workers. Why would he want a compensation study if he was not going to deal with the compensation during negotiations? He deals with all his salaries to his benefits. When he was moved, he was given money to buy a house. He has the best life insurance if, it, if anything happens to him. We have asked him historically not to hire people that do not benefit. He's had an issue with the HR. She was given money to relocate as well. 
Everything for management is okay. Cyril got a 35% increase. IT got a 40% increase. Angela got a 35% increase out of the salary study. And our members are not getting anything. These are the workers that make Metro, not them. It's the workers that make Metro. And he is insulting them with this. His situation is comfortable and you have allowed that for him. While our workers are not getting anything. One of his proposal was for members to not accrue time while they were on vacation or sick leave. How is that possible? How will he insult the workers in that way? We are asking you to have him return his team to the table and bargain in good faith. We have now countered to ourselves four times, lowering our amounts. We cannot lower our amounts anymore. So we're asking you to please interfere, intervene, and make these members whole. We did not suggest the salary study. It was his idea. And he doesn't want to address it now? When we are done, we know that he's going to get a humongous raise because this is what happens every single time. So please make this right. Thank you. Do I have other uh, union uh, representatives? Good morning, everybody. My name is Nathan Meisenheimer. I've been with Metro for almost four and a half years. These days, it's becoming increasingly difficult to make a living here in Santa Cruz. High rent costs, increasing fuel prices, food bills, et cetera, et cetera. We all feel the crunch. A lot of us live quite a distance from work to help alleviate the high cost of housing. I'm lucky to have found a place to live that is relatively close to Metro, but it does have, it, have its price. For my coworkers, they might pay less out of their wallets to live further away, but they pay a different price by doing so. They spend a lot of time sitting on the freeway, sitting in commute, taking time away from their families. Their eight hour workday becomes a 10 hour workday, sometimes more, all in the name of working in a place that can provide for their families. We make these sacrifices, not out of greed or personal gain, but out of necessity. Why do I stay? I do it for my family to provide them a roof over their head, food on their table, clothes on their back, to provide them with assurance that they will have the medical care available to them when needed, to provide them with a home in the same town where I work. I do it for my coworkers. I wake up every morning and come to work where I'm needed. I am but one part of a bigger picture. I am part of the Metro family. This family is responsible for providing transportation to the County of Santa Cruz and I'm proud to be a small part of that. Together, our individual pieces come together to create Santa Cruz Metro, and without one piece, we would not be able to provide the service that we do. We are important, and we should be treated as such. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Wes Guild. I'm your electronic tech, and I'm the VMU chapter president. Um, it's not easy uh, being a mechanic. It's very phys physically demanding and emotional or er, mentally taxing. We have a lot of young guys that end up with bad backs, bad shoulders, bad knees, all from working on our buses. Um, and we have people on graveyard, and I've seen a lot of studies showing that, you know, work, shift workers uh, are more likely to have heart disease, cancers, diabetes, and uh, sleep 
deprivation problems. Um, and now the metro has become a little restrictive with taking time off in our department. And um, we're finding it hard to kind of recharge our batteries, you know, go see our kids' recognitions, uh, give our wives a break from, you know, baby duty. <laughs> but uh, our guys just come to work and they just push themselves to be there every day and to try to do as best they can and to give 100%. But at some point, I'm afraid, you know, their bodies are just going to kind of break down. And they're going to get sick, not be at work, you know, everything that kind of falls with that. And, you know, recently they get to hear that the Metro effectively wants to freeze their, their wages, take away their shift differential, take away their ability to earn comp time or pay more for their medical. It's very difficult to get them to go above and beyond for the Metro when all these things are going on. Um, we'll get way more productivity from these guys if we have several mechanics, you know, recharged and wanting to respond to a bus that's on the side of the road, you know, top off the oil for a paracruise operator or <coughs> swap out a radiator, whatever it is, then to have one grizzled old mechanic that has to. Um, I kind of hope this made sense. It does. And, uh, you know, thank you for your time. Thank you for that presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Joan Jeffries. I represent SEA, a uh, chapter of SEIU. I wanted to talk just for a few moments. Um, we, we have this comp study that the district paid a lot of money for, um, $70,000 plus just for the SEIU portion of this study. And it is a flawed study. Um, I, I feel bad for certain positions and classifications that I feel were not adequately uh, uh, represented in this study, the compensation, the comparables that this vendor came back with. Um, don't really ac accurately reflect the importance or the depth of what certain classifications do. And yet, this is what we have. We've put a lot of money and a lot of time into this study. We realize we have to move forward with what we have, um, which is why I want to talk about the importance of cost of living increases. Uh, cost of living increases are, you know, I think a lot, a lot of members are going to see no increase from this comp study, basically. They're not going to see any significant increase or zero increase. And a cost of living increase is their only chance of seeing any type of increase. So I want to uh, give this to the board in, the, in their records. Uh, I printed out something that shows the cost of living uh, increase from 2014 up through today, uh, it shows each year, and the total increase from 2014 to today in our area is over 16%. So I'd like to put this in record. And then I would like to show you a copy of SEIU's wages, effective June 19th, 2014. And I would also like to show you SEIU's wages effective June 14th, 2018, which are still in effect today. And if you look at those two, you will see that the increase from 2014 to today is 2%, 2% in all this time. Now, there have been a few classifications that have been studied and have been increased. And then there are also our yearly step increases. But I would like to point out that once a person has worked in Metro for five years, they are at the top 
of their step increases. They have nowhere else to go. There is one exception to that, um, one exception, but for everyone else, after five years, you're at your top step. Cost of living increase is your only chance to, uh, to get a yearly increase after that. Um, we have been bargaining in good faith now for, I think, over two months. And as Olivia pointed out, we have repeatedly lowered and lowered and lowered what we have been asking for. And the district has budged incrementally small amounts. It is, um, it's demoralizing and it's disrespectful to all of our hardworking members. And we, we all do deserve more than this. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Joan. So here's our situation. We sent our letter of intent to negotiate March 29th. The district didn't come forward with any dates until mid-May. And we have 30 outstanding proposals combined with Paracruz that have yet to be responded to. So all we have seen is that they have been delaying, delaying, delaying. And they have came forward with proposals that Oh, especially with economics that are lower than what we should have already had it had we not froze our wages for so long to help the district that's very insulting and and not only that you know we we, we expected to at least get it compensated what we should have had you know especially when a district right now has over eight million dollars in reserves look I understand that there is a future liability for the OPEB and the UAL but we ask to hold off on any decisions until this contract is ratified and, you know, they're also coming after our medical and, our over, and trying to prohibit overtime. We explain how that's going to detriment the service because currently we're understaffed and the district is relying on us to work overtime. And not only that, we got a letter from our CEO not too long ago to try to encourage us to work more overtime. You know, it's contradicting. It's confusing and we don't know what's going on. You know, all of our proposals were actually mainly to try to reach parity with the rest of the departments here at Metro. They were not unreasonable. They could have came forward with something, but we didn't really see much of any movement. So what we did is we actually came forward with their first counter with the wages because it was very important for us to finish this contract by the end of this month under the condition they didn't touch our medical and touch and prohibit us from working overtime because it's very important for us because we don't want to leave the public behind. We care about the public and we, we need to work overtime. It, 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 they didn't have any rational explanation behind that. And uh, you know, our medical is very important for us. It's very expensive to live in this county. And then when we did that to try to give them a comprehensive package to try to get this contract done, they came lower than their initial wage ca uh, counter without really no movement on the medical or even prohibiting overtime. So to us, that's regressive bargaining and that's bad faith, you know? And Metro, we had to stand back while we watch all of management get raises and we're done. We just ask you guys to intervene now because it looks like Metro, you know, Metro's bargaining team is not budging. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nate Abrego, uh, representative of Paracruz and uh, on uh, the smart local 23 uh, bargaining team. And I just want to put it out there and I just want to restate it because it's been said before. Uh, we've already frozen our wages. We've put in our time. We've dealt with lack of staff for many years and we still are. We paid our dues. It's time we get what's fair. Right. Thank you.
Are there any other speakers? Hi, I'm Brandon Freeman, Senior Vice Chair of Smart UTU Local 23. I'm not gonna repeat too much of what was already said here. I think you guys pretty much get the gist. I just wanted to touch on a couple more things. Um, if you look at our schedule today, you'll notice we didn't take overtime. Three sit calls, you're dropping routes right now. Why should we give up our seventh day? Why did we give you 2% over all these years if you're gonna give us nothing? Come back to the table, give us a real proposal, stop playing games. Mr. Clifford makes almost the same amount himself as our entire bargaining team. Maybe he should sit at the table with us. Thank you. <laughs> morning. I'm Vicki Trent. I'm also on the negotiating committee. Been a bus driver. I'm in my 18th year, though I took a break and became a lawyer during that time. I'm glad to be sitting at the table. We've got a couple of high-priced, outrageously expensive lawyers across the table from us. I don't know why the district is paying all that money when there are all kinds of people who could be at the table with us. I would like to see this come to a close quickly. Bus drivers work so hard every single day. We are the face, we are the heart and the soul and the feet and the arms of this agency. Thank you for please being fair with us. Solidarity. Thank you. Good morning, board, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Bonnie Moore, and I'm also a bus operator. I've been here since 1989. I've been currently working directly for the International Union, so I'm on a leave. Um, but I am also here as a representative with our bus operators, my bus operators, your bus operators here in, in, in Santa Cruz. These folks have been putting in time and time and time continuously to make up for shortfalls of the district. Not enough employees, not enough drivers, and therefore they are required to work that overtime. And they do come in and they do the do. And it is a commitment from every one of these drivers and operators to make sure that the public is being moved to where they need to go. And the public depends on us to be there. And we are there. We're there continuously. We're sitting at the table. We, the, the district wanted only non-economic proposals to be dealt with first. Fine. They've got almost 20 articles non-economic that are sitting out, of there, out there that have not even been responded to at all. We're still waiting on that. They gave us a proposal. You've got the two attorneys that are very smart. You've got the director of finance. You've got the operations manager. You've got human resources. They gave us a proposal. You know, and they talked about, oh, the district doesn't want to negotiate against themselves. Well, you're the only ones that have that ability to make those movements. We've given back, we've backed off, we've come down. We went ahead and took the figures from their financial proposal. We wanted our medical to stay the same. But we said, okay, we'll go with that, fine. And we'll figure out how to deal with the medical. And then they came back with a lower proposal, a lower proposal. You guys know what that does. Michael, you know what happens when you come back with a lowered proposal without excuses or excuses. It doesn't matter. But there needs to be some decent movement going forward. These guys gave up their raises for four years. They didn't move for four years, yet the service go went on at a pristine level. Because we get compliments from people traveling into this community from all over the world. We are always complimented about the service. And it isn't because they see your faces or they see the general manager's face. It's only because they see the driver's faces. Yeah. And these guys are out there every day, all day long. Their hours, their spreads, their time that they put in is huge. And they cover every piece, every piece of service that's open that needs to be covered. You're attacking us right now on how we've been functioning. You're attacking our medical back to the levels of 2005. What is the point of that? Everything else is going up. They've sat frozen for four years, and you think that the minimal raise that you're offering us is going to make a difference, and it'll be a wash with the cost of the medical. What the hell is that? 
I'm sorry, but what is that? This needs to start moving forward in a productive manner. Your team that sits at that table needs to be a little bit more productive. Let's get these proposals out of the way. Let's put a little additional on that table. Let's fix the medical and stop harming your own employees. We're here to do the job for you. And it means a lot to us to be able to do that for you. We've, we've been here for an awfully long time. You've been here for an awfully long time. Cynthia, you've been here. Bruce, you've been here for an awfully long time. John, you've been here for an awfully long time. So have we. Some of the other folks here have not. Maybe they don't understand Santa Cruz. But we're here, we're your employees. Give us that ability to continue working. Give us the ability to get a decent contract. We're not asking for the moon. We're asking pretty much to kind of keep what we got and give us some additional wages. That's what we need. Make up for four years of nothing, nothing. So please, I ask of you, either give them the authority because they've already hemmed in hard as to whether they actually have authority. But we need to get this resolved. We don't, we, you know, we've got dates set into the middle of July right now, and we need to get it resolved. All of your employees need their contracts resolved so we can continue working in good faith and harmony. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers that would like to speak from the union? The big, the, oh, go ahead. Uh, good morning. My name is Erlen Osorio. I'm representing Smart Local 23. I've been working f uh, for Metro for about 14 years. I started with uh, Paracruz for about a year and a half, and now I've been a bus driver since then. Um, I would like to say uh, it's hard for me um, to be able to afford to live in Santa Cruz. I've come, I've been doing this commute for 14 years from Salinas um, because it's hard to afford to live in uh, Santa Cruz with the wage, but you know, I'm still hanging in there. I would like to say if you guys uh, consider um, giving us what we're asking and what we deserve, you know, we are the face of Metro. Everybody sees us, the public, and thank you for, for your time. Thank you. I'm Abulalio Abrego, um, representative. I've been in a um, um, negotiation table. And I just want to um, put something extra, but probably um, my coworkers escape about it. But I'm talking about the overtime. Overtime, I've been noticed that it's been provoked from above, from the management. It's been provoked because every time the board asked Mr. Clifford, why we not hire more drivers? And the answer, Mr. Clifford, is, well, we have to be cautious. But meanwhile, we're working a lot of overtime, too much. Yeah. It's because they are under the staff, under trying to hire drivers. They are probably, they are hire drivers outside that want to work for Metro. But because being, being used in cautious, is what happened right now. And they don't care if the people fire. And I've been hearing from management from my, are my top um, um, supervisors. They said, that's okay, we don't care. We don't care. So we care about public. So it's been inflated the overtime. So thank you guys. Thank you. Time. Thank you. My name is Ryan McDonald. I'm a fourth generation Santa Cruz resi resident, um, and I've worked for the Metro for nearly 15 years. I'm proud to do so. I rode the bus to go to school. I rode the bus to go to work as a young adult, and I'd like to continue to be proud to, to work for the Metro. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Elmer Torres. I've been a facilities maintenance worker for the last 20 years. Last time I went to a board meeting, I went to receive my award for my 20th anniversary. 
And then uh, it's a good job. I like my job, and I, I enjoy working for the Metro. Some years back, I was forced to move out of the area, well, this county, because I couldn't afford it anymore. So I live in Monterey County, and I do that commute every single day, put in like probably 10 and a half sometimes because of the traffic and all that. So, but I want to speak directly to Mr. Ratkin over there. And Mr. Uh, Clifford got his uh, steps reset. I don't know if you all remember that. Uh, we remember. So you promise us at the board meeting and you say, when your time comes, you're going to get your increment. Don't worry about it. Remember that? Uh, that was televised. That's in the records. Just when I say that. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Karen Blight, and I worked for Metro for 11 years. I'm an admin assistant, so my face is not out there with everyone else, but I am also a face of Metro, and I hope you guys will remember this. Um, I want to speak to the fact that I love my job. I really love it. Um, but it is difficult and challenging. I started out at a step three, so I only got step increases for three more years. The only thing I get is a COLA, and we haven't had one for four years, okay? So I really, really would appreciate if we would get a COLA and bring us up with inflation and put us through, um, you know, get us through the day. And that's all I want to say. I want to thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to us from the union? Okay, we're going to close that portion. But before you leave, I, I just want to acknowledge a couple things from the board. Um, we heard what you said. I acknowledge that uh, most people came up here and said they love their jobs. And people said that they want to be fairly compensated for what they do. And we heard that message. And I, I also want to commend you on being organized, being respectful, and, and coming here and, and saying the things that you needed to say. And, and we have a closed session today. And We'll be dealing with these issues, and uh, I appreciate that you come here and stand up for what you believe in. So thank you for that. You. Okay, with that, um, do we have any additional documentation for agenda items? None? All right, we're going to go to the uh, consent agenda. Um, these are items we normally deal with in one motion. <clears throat> uh, is there anybody who'd like to pull anything from the consent agenda? Ch Chair, I think we are pulling or would recommend 9-14 on the being pulled. I was going to pull that. I just want to see if there's anything else anybody had. <laughs> We're going to pull. Given. Is there any other items? That uh, I have a couple, and they're, they're not going to be heavy duty. They're minor. They're just questions you want to ask? Or, or cr minor corrections. Okay. I want to see if, uh, if Guy Preston is here. Is Guy Preston here? Yeah, he is. Yeah, Guy, come on He's up. Right in the middle. We're going to go ahead and pull item uh, uh, 914, but I just want to comment from Guy to add some clarification on this item and give the board direction. We had an RTC meeting yesterday, and this will provide some clarity. So, Mr. Preston, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, Chair Bothorf, and I appreciate you uh, um, giving me the opportunity to come up and speak regarding this item. Um, as some of you are aware, because you also sit on the RTC board, um, uh, the equivalent item was um, on the RTC agenda yesterday, and we did receive direction and input from the, um, both the public um, and the RTC guy, commission. Can you just wait just a moment, because the audience that's here needs a little bit more time so they can hear you as well. If we could get someone to close the doors in the back, that would be great, so we can continue. Close. We're close. I think Eddie's going to close that door, and then we'll uh, we'll be fine. I mean, even the 
appropriate to extend. Go ahead, Mr. Preston. Thank you. I'll start over a little bit. Okay, um, good. Re regarding this item, which was on the RTC Commission agenda yesterday, and, and many of uh, you serve both on that um, commission as well as this board, um, the item is related to doing an alternatives analysis on the uh, Santa Cruz um, branch line for high capacity public transit. And um, at that meeting, I was seeking input from from the commission and also um, had an opportunity for public to have input regarding this item. Um, the direction I received was to make improvements in the RFP and um, to come back in August. So this is, uh, I saw this on the consent agenda here for your approval and um, it's appropriate um, to not of course approve something that another body is going back and, and going to take action on. So. Um, I, I am interested in receiving Metro input on this item. So um, after it is pulled off consent, um, instead of approving that, it, if we could receive um, your input on it. A additionally, any input that you may have regarding how the two um, bodies should work together and you know um, provide approval for you know uh, other items coming forward, including this you know, after the August meeting at the RTC, the August meeting here, and then as the scope um, um, is finalized and then put out two proposals, uh, four proposals that um, when we come back during certain steps uh, of development of the alternatives analysis, how you want me to and Alex to present this item and what we should be requesting from this board. Great, uh, Director Rodkin. Without uh, foreclosing the possibility of discussion, would you have a problem if we simply uh, postpone this till after you, uh, the RTC makes a recommendation to us as was originally planned? So in other words, postpone it till August. Would that be a problem for you? I just want to know, I, I don't mind postponing it and coming back in August, but I would like to receive any input that might be different from what I received um, yesterday at the RTC meeting. I think the proposed schedule would be an RTC meeting in early August and then a Metro meeting at the end of the month. So, but if there are directors that have comments, they can get those to Mr. Clifford and, uh, and Metro has any comments, they can uh, deliver those to you. So that would be a great plan to proceed. Yeah, I think he's interested in hearing if the, the Metro board members who aren't RTC members want to share anything. I think he's looking to get that today because, and, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Preston, is as the uh, RTC redrafts uh, the alternative analysis RFP, uh, 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 what we talked about y yesterday, he wants to make sure to include everything so nothing comes back later where we have to stall it anymore. Right. Are there any d directors that have any input for Mr. Preston? And if you don't have it now, you can, you can uh, email it to him or contact the office and deliver that so you have time to think about it. Go ahead. Uh, I'll just point out that the um, the RFP that we received at the RTC and that's in front of us here actually is pretty good for the economic issues that are uh, central uh, importance to the district. The uh, other issues that, are, that would the uh, RTC was looking for more augmentation and development of uh, the environmental issues and the impacts on uh, underserved communities um, is something that I think we are basically trying to increase in some way. And those are issues for the district, but I think that the concerns the district has are, were pretty well covered in the existing uh, RFP. Th those were not problematic, I don't, at least not to me. And uh, so I don't think we're going to have a whole lot of stuff that we need to, uh, that we want to ask for changed in that, uh, which otherwise might be the case. Go ahead. I just want to, uh, so a little bit of education here. On 9-14-2, uh, number five, alternatives considered. Uh, and this is from uh, us, the Metro says, and Metro says, Metro cannot participate in the RTCA double uh, alternative analysis process as Metro is a county high capacity public transit provider and has a vested interest in planning that will affect its future commitment as resources staff does not recommend this alternative. Can I have a little bit more insight on that or? Or I could try to answer that question, or, or Alex can, because I read that too. And um, the way the, and, and tell me, Alex, if I got this wrong, but the way I understood that was you were providing an alternative to not participating. Yeah. And, and the staff was not recommending that you don't participate. It's not that you shouldn't participate. It's the alternative to participating would be to not participate and staff is recommending that you don't 
select the option to not participate. Yeah. Well, it, well, essentially, what they're saying is they would like our input. Okay, <laughs> they would like input. But, but, they don't, but we shouldn't give our input. Well, we could, no, we could, the option could be to choose not to participate, which is, which is not the recommended choice. Did I get that right, Alex? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I concur, yeah. although I will not try to repeat what Guy just said. Um, yeah, well, as you know, in all of your board reports, we put <coughs> alternatives. And alternatives are things like do nothing or tell, we're, tell staff we're all washed up and come up with a different alternative. So this is just one of those. Sometimes it's a stretch to think of an alternative. This is probably a good example. Okay. So at this point, we'd like to, I'd like, you know, if I can get a motion from someone to continue this to the August meeting, that's what I'm looking for. So moved. I'll motion second. and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, this will be carried to our August meeting. Mr. Preston, thank you for coming and making that presentation. Thank you for having me. Okay. So with that, Cynthia, you have a couple of items that you want yeah, to... Yeah, and uh, honestly, these won't take long. Sure. Uh, one is 9-03, and <coughs> the other is 9-15. They're, they're quite minor. Um, and Go ahead with three. And let's um, 9-03, it's on page dot two. Uh, reports on the um, MAC meeting. It was confusing, and I think these are just language changes. It, they refer to, at one place, lift line, but it's spelled with a Y. So I don't know if that's oh, lift line with an I. Is the, is but then in the, the and yeah. then, then in the next paragraph, they talk about lift with a Y. So I don't know what was intended, but it should be cleaned up before it's We're going to go official. to LIFT, okay, and, and instead that, of the Uber but then, competitor. Yeah. No, but then at the bottom it says the Central California Alliance for Health is using lift. That's probably with a Y. Probably is correct. So just, just okay. that's spelling. The spell check got added and then yeah. it messed it up um, is what happened. On 9-03C-2, um, there's a comment um, uh, quoting me <laughs> about... Um, uh, possible funding sources. It, it, uh, it says she expects her lack of optimism regarding the availability of additional funding sources generally. And what I did was express skepticism about success of another ballot measure in the near future. Those are different. So those are different. And I remember those comments. So yeah. we'll make um, sure those, those, those are correct. The next page just refers in comments attributed to you, uh, Chair. Uh, referring to local politicians and local politicians. And pr I personally prefer the term elected representatives. So that's just language. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so with that, if people are agreeable to that, I'll move. I'll make a motion on the consent agenda and accept that as is friendly. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second, <laughs> second by uh, Leopold. So motion by Rock and second by Leopold for the consent Chair, agenda. Chair, I just wanted to make one comment one about one of the items. Go ahead. Um, uh, on... Uh, on item number 912, the evolution of the uh, fleet to zero emission buses, I really appreciate this report. I think it's very thorough. Nice. And it's a good explanation of, of what we're trying to do in terms of our goal. And I appreciate the work of staff to, uh, to put that together. Uh, and I think it's useful, especially for the public who's very concerned um, uh, uh, about uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the progress that we're making in our plans. So thank you. Thank you for those comments. I, and I want to comment. I actually see that as a model. We have a lot of pressure in the city to immediately buy all electric vehicles. And that that is a very logical expression of a longer-term commitment, but the realities of year to year. So I, I agree. That was a good model. Great, great comments. Any other comments on the agenda? Okay, we've got... Cynthia had said she had two items. Yeah. She, had so she did. And, uh, and the I other is the 9-15. Uh, minutes on three were the correction. I got that. And then 915 was the uh, uh, her comments yeah, Mr. Said about and um, that has to do with uh, the um, eco pass um, we did pass it at the city council um, the only difference was that we passed it with a condition that we get a report back at the six month point point from the program going into effect it's a very ambitious pilot and we thought it was important that um, uh, as we have six months experience and as at that time we'll be going into budget discussions for the subsequent year, uh, that we get a report at six months of the utilization, how it's going, how effective it is. So um, there again, uh, with the board's uh, approval, I'd like to move approval of that uh, with the expectation that Metro par participate in the six-month uh, report back to both bodies. That's friendly. Friendly, and with the second? 
and late. Okay. Any other comments? All right. So uh, uh, we mo one motion on the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It carries unanimously with the corrections that were, were mentioned. Okay. Brings us to the uh, regular agenda. Uh, we're going to begin with. Uh, Yes. Yeah. The entire consent agenda with the items that were were were, uh, were corrected or amended. Okay. So we'll take us to the uh, uh, regular agenda. We have longevity awards. I'm not sure how many. Did we? Uh, Ciro, is Ciro here? Do we have a? Uh, how many people are here for the longevity awards? Zero. And what about the uh, <laughs> retirement? None. Okay, so uh, items uh, 10 is uh, just want to acknowledge um, presentation of uh, longevity awards. Can you read those names, Mike? Yes, we have longevity awards for 20 years for Francisco Calderon, Patricia Cummings, Andre Hart, and Lynn Hershey. Percy, sorry. Okay, and then the, the other is a resolution for the retiree of, uh, who was it you named? Ernest Brown and Bill Yeo. Okay, so I'll take a motion for the resolution. So moved. Motion second. by Leopold. No, second. second. Second by Kaufman Gomez. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries unanimously. So that'll take us to uh, our one of our favorite parts of our Metro meetings is our legislative updates. And we're going to begin with a uh, state update from Josh Shaw. Welcome, Josh. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good morning. We can work out the fireworks show here. Okay. I can start, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, Chairman and Board Members. Joshua Shaw with Shaw, Yoder, and Antwi, your legislative advocacy firm in Sacramento. The CEO has asked me to do a quick scan of the latest developments at the state level. I know you've been back to D.C. more recently, and it's admittedly more exciting in <coughs> D.C. But in Sacramento, there are some decisions being made that affect public transit. I'll scan through, thank you, Gina. I'll scan through a few different bills for you, and there's probably some uh, written handouts in front of you. Um, working with your legal counsel and the CEO over the last year, we've been scanning your enabling statutes. As a special transit district, as you know, the state creates your organizational structure, grants through statutes your powers and authorities, and legal counsel has noticed several areas that can be brought up to sort of more modern public transit standards. And Assembly Bill uh, 1089, carried by our Assembly Member Mark Stone, uh, would make several important changes in your enabling statutes. I think a committee of the board has talked about those before. One of the things we're really trying to bring to the table is some additional best value procurement um, authority, which allows you to really get the best, uh, most complex services and, and, and uh, products on the marketplace and ensure it works for Metro. That bill's moving very rapidly through the process, frankly, on consent, sometimes best values, somewhat controversial in Sacramento but we've been able to move it through the assembly. It's positioned in the Senate to probably be voted out of the legislature next week, Monday or Tuesday, uh, first week of July, and then to the governor. So that's going well. Um, then a number of other bills that could affect public transit and or the cities and counties that work with public transit districts. There aren't too many bills this year sponsored by uh, the transit industry, but we're reacting to a number of different bills that could affect you. Um, you all are aware that the legislature and uh, newly elected Governor Newsom are very focused on housing and housing production and there's uh, different ideas about how to sort of compel or incentivize or even punish cities and counties that in the state's view aren't doing uh, the right thing. Senate Bill 50 is one that would have required ministerial approval of certain housing and for a transit agency it matters because there are definitions of near public transit service or located around transit stations. That bill very controversial, but but has some dedicated champions in the Senate, uh, uh, particularly has been made a two-year bill. So the conversation will continue, uh, presumably, but it's not moving for the rest of this year. And by the way, this year's uh, first year of the two-year session, the legislature will work till September 13th, take a break in the winter and come back next January. Um, just kind of going in numerical order, Senate Bill 336 by Senator Dodd is actually sponsored by our, our brothers and sisters in labor that would require fully automated transit vehicles to be uh, staffed by a transit employee, kind of raising the interesting question of what does it mean to be fully automated versus staffed, and uh, that's actually just been made a two-year bill. It had gotten out of the Senate, and our slide says referred to the Assembly Transportation Committee, but just I think last night the Senator decided to put that on hold for a while because there are some 
technical issues and some policy issues that he wants to spend more time talking about, including with transit agencies like ours. So we'll be involved in that uh, over the rest of the summer and the fall, and, and he'll probably get it going again in January of next year. Assembly Bill 314 is a bill sponsored by our, again, and, uh, our brothers and sisters in labor that makes a number of changes in eight different statutes that govern employee-employer relationships across the number of public agency sectors. It really has to do with release time and a number of the associations that represent agencies, uh, public agencies, cities, counties, special districts, transit agencies have concerns with that bill, trying to work those out with the author. AB 516 has to do, seemingly on the face of it, narrowly the city and county rights to tow vehicles that have been parked you know, beyond uh, the posted ordinance time. There are some transit districts that have towing authority and we're working with uh, CEO Clifford and your legal counsel to make sure we understand the impact, if any adverse impact on, for instance, Metro's uh, towing operations, which are few and far between, but could be impacted by this bill. AB 752 is sponsored by an assembly member from Los Angeles who has a, uh, probably a really great public policy outcome idea that there shall be lactation rooms at transit stations as defined. The focus is really on rail stations, statutorily in the bill on inner city rail stations, but it has a multimodal aspect and to the degree the county obviously has been talking about rail service for years that could have a downstream impact and we're trying to make sure in the, in the short term that applies to the very literally physically largest multimodal rail transit stations in the state. Maybe the Deerodon station over the hill right now in this area, nothing anytime soon here, but we're keeping an eye on that one. It also sets an interesting precedent for other public transit infrastructure. Uh, AB 784, the supervisor mentioned the Metro plan to transition to zero emission buses. You have a plan in place or you're beginning to develop the transition plan. The current technology is more costly. This bill actually is the one bill sponsored by folks in the, trans in the public transit industry. It would grant a sales tax exemption from the state's sales tax, not local uh, imposed sales taxes, for purchase by public transit agencies of new zero emission buses. So it just kind of makes a, uh, a marginal t uh, cost increase a little bit more palatable for your already you know, stretched public transit agency budgets. That bill is moving through the process and we feel good that uh, the legislature will pass it and Governor Newsom hopefully will look favorably upon it. AB 1351 by an assembly member who represents the high desert area in Los Angeles, he had a constituent who, had, who was uh, certified at his transit agency to ride the service as a disabled individual under the ADA, had some contretemps with a other visit, uh, neighboring transit system who didn't uh, necessarily honor the, the certification. And so this assembly member has introduced a statewide bill that would, uh, would have imposed new restrictions on all transit agencies, but really frankly, not consistent with the no, nearly 30 year old, well understood, robust set of regulations that apply at the federal level to transit agencies under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we're trying to really work with the author to turn that more into a study. There are some authorities for our California State Transportation Agency to ultimately adopt guidelines after doing those studies. My view, probably not necessary because the federal government this is a well settled matter of public transit policy. So that's a thorny one, but it's receiving a very sympathetic you know, hearing in Sacramento, as you might imagine. Um, Assembly Bill 1568, somewhat like the Senate Bill 50 notion that I mentioned of the state kind of telling cities and counties more how to do housing production, this one had behind it the teeth of threatening transportation funding. Uh, uh, Secretary McPherson talked at the beginning of this morning's hearing about the concern about city and county roads. This bill would actually hold back funding for cities and counties in the transportation world to the degree the housing plans aren't in the assembly member's definition consistent with where the state wants to go. That has been frankly opposed by a wide variety of organizations, cities, counties, transit agencies, who all worked hard to pass SB1 in 2017 and you know, watch the vote of the people who defeated Proposition 6, which would have sunset our new transit and transportation funding last November. Um, and so the assembly member has made this a two-year bill. Uh, but that precedent, yes sir. I just wanted to ask a question about this. Sure. I know that the state identified, I think, 13 jurisdictions that they consider to be in violation. Right. Is, would this bill apply to only those, or is it a broader definition? So, Senator McCarty started with a broader definition. In the last few days, literally last night, the governor and the legislative leaders working on the state budget for 2019-20 
developed a trailer bill that really gets to the point you're asking about, the governor's identification of the sort of bad actors, in his words, cities and counties, and they've fashioned a budget trailer bill that uh, gets to the issue. It doesn't involve withholding any transportation funds. There are penalties on the stick side. There are incentives on the, you know, comply and you get uh, bonuses for grant requests. This bill, hopefully in a sense, because um, I assume that budget trailer bill will be passed early next week and the governor will sign it. He signed the state budget yesterday. I think that precedent makes this bill moot, but it remains to be seen how hard, whether and how hard the assembly member continues to push this sort of broader, potentially more injurious uh, perspective. So we'll monitor that closely. It, 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 here to four, for what it's worth, bless you, the, uh, this kind of bill has never impinged on public transit funding directly. It has been city or county road dollars. Um, that actually is changing in his view as well. He's looking at other funds because the city and county transportation dollars are actually protected in the Constitution. But the concept's still out there. Uh, so th that was a race through bills. Happy to answer any other questions, and I will pause and talk less fast at the end. But I also want to give you a sense of the 19, uh, uh, the 2019, 2020 budget that was just signed into law last night. From a transit perspective, there was a one-time appropriation of nearly $200 million in cap and trade funds to an Air Resources Board program that does help public transit agencies like us or school schools or others, folks in the commercial world, uh, purchase these new zero emission uh, heavy engine, heavy duty engine technology with a rebate aspect. That money goes to buy down the still current higher costs of the electric uh, bus technology. And our, our, in our transit world, we pushed hard for a big appropriation there and it's a slight increase over the current year's appropriation and that's something Metro could take advantage of over the coming years. And we just talked about with the, with the supervisor, uh, the governor's original January call for punishing cities. He also said withhold Senate Bill 1 streets and roads funding and I just described uh, the solution that's referenced up there on the slide that came together late yesterday. Um, the CEO has also asked me to talk about a couple of broader issues spearheaded by the California Transit Association representing Metro and Ms. Clifford and many of your staff members are very active in various committees there, <laughs> including on this ongoing effort to try to create a smoother path for agencies like Metro to implement the Air Resources Board's new zero emission bus requirement, which requires you to transition your fleet uh, by 2040 at the latest. And one of the aspects of that is uh, 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 putting together a task force of professionals throughout our public transit industry, now that we have a regulation, who will come together to try to develop best practices, training, technical implementation, uh, uh, thoughts and ideas, including, if necessary, advocating for additional resources. That Zero Emission Bus Task Force is uh, uh, working with a bunch of agencies, including Metro, to figure out the path forward. So hopefully those learnings can be replicated on throughout your agency. Yes, sir. So. Um, I don't think we've had a problem with the idea of the 2040 deadline for zero emission. But in, there's also currently under the airboard structure, uh, uh, I think, uh, I guess, correct me if I have it wrong, but uh, prohibition about buying non-electric buses after 26. What's happening with that uh, provision? The, the, the regulation that applies to us would essentially be a, a de facto prohibition after uh, 2028, I believe, if I'm doing the math, because they a bus useful life is roughly 12 years, and the deadline to get full transition is 2040, and that does imply a procurement schedule ahead of that 2040 deadline, and that will be a challenging issue. Uh, I think that answered your question, but if it but didn't, my question is: Are there discussions of modifying that, or is that just that's going that's what's happening, and nobody's challenging it, or what's going on? So that? I would right now there are not because that regulation is only six months old for the three to four years during the run-up of that regulation, there was a lot of challenge to the milestones. And in fact, we successfully pushed them off farther 2040, which with that 2028 kind of practical procurement milestone is, believe it or not, much longer than the air, where the Air Resources Board started. But at a certain point, particularly under Governor Brown's leadership and the, the folks who were then on the Air Resources Board, it was pushed as far as possible, in, in my opinion. Uh, as if agencies like this or others around the state find it, you know, as a practical matter, with full, sincere, good faith efforts, just can't get there, we would, of course, go back and try to revisit that. But right now, it's not on the table, per se. And, and 
I'm not sure of the full implications, but the federal government now defines the useful life of a bus as 14 years. Does right. the state of California share that definition? So we put that on the table as well, and uh, kind of arguing for like 2042, they kind of moved the front end goalpost closer to, to today's time. But we're, we're aware of that, and we'll, like I say, in maybe five or six years, as we get closer to 2028, be very clear about the challenges at the time. And uh, over the last 20 years, there have been successful reopenings of the regulation that has ultimately led to zero emission. Um, no, prom no promises, <laughs> but if it's a practical challenge, I'm hoping that the you know, uh, cooler, cooler heads will prevail in Sacramento. Uh, but very much related to this challenge is uh, the cost of electricity. There's a regulation that requires us to do certain things, but there's no guarantee that our investor-owned utilities or other power supply entities like PG&E will be there for us, or if they are there for us, what are the rates? Uh, current demand charges are very difficult for, for public sector agencies, period, much less when there's suddenly a whole fleet of electric buses running around, is the price of fuel, so to speak, gonna skyrocket. And so we're involved in a regulatory issue, IOU by IOU, uh, urging new commercial electric vehicle rates that are more friendly to public transit. Under the auspices of the California Public Utilities Commission, there's some traction on that. Uh, your agency's been involved in providing technical input on that, and we'll keep trying to push as hard as we can on providing a, a fertile ground for more friendly public transit uh, demand charges. And then a couple of other sort of future issues, but that uh, Metro is involved in right now. The legislature last year asked the California Transit Association to open up the Transportation Development Act, a 45 plus year old law that provides the basic transit funding from the state, a quarter percent of the state sales tax. It's billions of dollars a year. Also the state transit assistance program. There are qualification criteria uh, that the state holds you to, which are occasionally admittedly difficult for some agencies to meet, but the, the the back end uh, punitive aspect is funding can be withheld. Legislature asked us to consider reforms and proposals next year for possible legislative action that keep accountability in place from the legislature's perspective, but provide some fe flexibility for public transit agencies. Uh, your CEO is vet directly involved personally in, in the work of trying to come up with the best potential proposal to the state on that issue. And then finally, um, there were some issues mentioned about training, uh, I think in the zero emission bus space. Um, uh, the association, Mr. Clifford asked me to mention that the California Transit Association is developing a Leadership California Transit Association kind of statewide effort to uh, really lift up uh, current staff, maybe at the lower management levels or mid-level executives to kind of get uh, more, even more strongly on that executive track, sharpening skill sets, developing executive decision making, possibly something like Leadership Santa Cruz, but really with a California transit uh, perspective, and your CEO is very involved in the group that's putting together that potential curriculum for transit staff throughout uh, California. So I raced through a lot that's going on at the state level. <clears throat> I'll stop and breathe, and happy to answer any other questions or get out of your hair for the morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Josh. Any questions for Mr. Shaw? Well, I, I think you, you were thorough, thorough, okay, thorough. and thank you yeah, for that. I always look forward to that presentation. Uh, hey, I know it's more exciting in D.C., but you guys sometimes go back and visit and walk around with Chris. I'm happy to host you in uh, the state capitol <laughs> next year. <laughs> I'm tired of going back to really hot D.C. Yeah. 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 Make us a proposal for when we should go and so forth. Yeah. Be helpful. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Mr. Rocky would like to know what restaurants you'll take them to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Josh. Hey, Chris, hold on. i got a public comment on that first. Come on up, Bonnie. Thank you, thank you, Josh, for your report. I appreciate it, it's been a while. Um, I did want to clarify one thing, which is on Senate Bill 336, not all of labor is supporting this bill at all. Actually, our union has been opposing this bill. We have been following it and tracking it right now that it's been moved to a two-year bill. Um, I believe it comes up again to the floor where we'll be able to present our opposition. Remind us what it's about. I'm sorry, automated vehicles. Thank you. Automation. It's about automation with no actual driver on board, no ability to stop it. And it's how quickly do we forget that an automated vehicle actually killed somebody in Arizona about a year and a half ago. And it's like you wait a long time and everybody seems to forget. 
that those fatalities do happen. Now, companies that are developing this technology and these vehicles are stating things that, well, we're getting better at it and the cameras view everything and less likely that somebody will be killed again. Um, but there was also a survey that was done and I want to say somewhere between 75 and 80% of the people that were asked, I don't know how many people were asked, stated that they would not get on a vehicle without a, a driver on that vehicle. And it needs to be something more than just an employee, a meet and greet kind of person from, that you, we know from Home Depot or Walmart. You need to have somebody on that vehicle that is actually skilled and trained in transporting folks. Currently, there are uh, two areas where I know that these vehicles are operating. They're on private parking lots. They're at large campuses where they're bringing employees into like Google or, or um, Oracle, or one of the larger corporations with multi-parking areas. Um, the reason for this is because they want to put these onto public streets. Um, they've sold it to Sacramento, and Sacramento says, oh yeah, we'll look at a pilot project here. Our community is not designed for any type of an automated vehicle at all. We have hills, and we've got mountain roads, and you know we've got people. <laughs> that actually have the right of way, and we give the right of way. Um, so, you know, just so you know that there is opposition to this, AFL-CIO's position on autonomous vehicles is not the same as the CalFed's position. So, you know, there is a little bit of um, conflict and confusion that's going on there, but that's our position as far as automated vehicles go. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that update. <laughs> Mr. Otto, you have a comment? So, uh, Keith Otto, so in the long list of bills there, one of the ones that was mentioned uh, was uh, Senate Bill 50, uh, Senate Bill 50, and um, I, I might have missed it, but I didn't hear anything about Senate Bill, I believe it's 592. So, uh, Senate Bill 50 was put on a two-year program, but through the gut and amend process, a bill initially slated uh, dealing with um, uh, barbers and cosmetology or something is now the, has the contents of much of what is in um, SB 50 and that is uh, in process. So just wanted to um, surface that and maybe it was mentioned but I missed it. Okay, great. All right. We'll close on in the uh, state presentation and now Mr. Julio will uh, come up and give us a federal legislative update. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Mr. Chair. This feels familiar. Uh, for those of you who were here yesterday for the RTC, I'll try to do better. Uh, and uh, I even did a little PowerPoint again, my second year in a row. Josh is bringing my game up. <laughs> we, we love the competition. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can tell us what the um, temperature is in uh, Washington right now. Don't, don't try and talk faster than you do. <laughs> no, <laughs> not possible. <laughs> so thanks again for having me. It's great, to, it's great to be here. I think I'm contractually obligated to mention that the weather here is so beautiful. Uh, and, uh, compared, especially compared to what it's like in D.C., I think it's like 97 and heat indexes are, you know, going off on my phone all for the last few days. So it really is nice to be here. So hopefully uh, I can give you kind of a little bit of a federal update with, uh, you know, what's going on transportation-wise with a kind of a transit twist um, here in D.C. And we will start with the, with the April trip. Uh, thank you again for the directors that came. Uh, it's, uh, this is not, uh, and I know the directors on here can, can vouch for this, this is not a sightseeing trip to D.C. Uh, I call it more of a forced march uh, <laughs> for two days uh, from office to office to anyone who will listen to us. And uh, the CEO, of course, has sort of directed me in general to look under every rack, rock in Washington, D.C. For, uh, for resources, but I think that uh, you guys come and you, prevent, you present a really strong story. Uh, and so I think in Washington, we punch above our weight. You know, we're a small uh, agency, uh, but people listen to, uh, to us because you guys present uh, our, our challenges, our difficulties, and the things we do well uh, in a really relatable way. And so, um, you know, we meet with our congressional delegation, and of course, they're going to be supportive of the things we do. Uh, and Congressman Eshoo and Congressman Panetta, again, 
really, really helpful with, with the things that we do. But when we go and see congressional committees who are, who are taking care of the, um, the policy issues on the federal level, uh, again, I think that we've, we've done a good job of sort of giving them a, a, a piece uh, of what small agencies uh, have to go through on a daily basis and continually you know, challenging um, with regard to capital uh, needs, uh, et cetera. The other thing that we've been doing recently has been visiting with the members of the House Transportation Committee, uh, which again provides these authorizations, uh, and talking particularly to the California members there, uh, neither Congressman Manesha or Panetta are on that committee, and so trying to again sort of talk about Santa Cruz's, uh, Santa Cruz's story with these other California members, I think helps, uh, helps them uh, when, they, when they will get around to, to doing that. And then, of course, at the Department of Transportation, uh, we go there with, with hat in hand. Uh, but again, also talking about our story, to sell our story to the people who are making those grants. Again, you folks, thank you again. It makes my job easier when I can come in after you and, uh, and talk, about, uh, talk about things. They know I'm coming to them uh, with, with power behind me. So, uh, of course, we've discussed our long-term funding needs, uh, both um, you know, sort of in the larger sense of, of federal transit funding uh, and our individual sense too, uh, advocated for grant information. And then again, uh, this FAST Act, which is the uh, authorizing legislation that, uh, uh, that uh, authorizes federal highway and transit programs, usually on a four to five year basis, expiring in 2010. And so we're looking for uh, 2020, thank you, 2010, not 1913. Uh, <laughs> 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 he turned it on you, so it was okay. <laughs> you have to bring that up again. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> 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 Bruce gets to leave first. Oh, brother. Right. <laughs> the inside joke here is Bruce <laughs> misspoke <laughs> yeah, mis mis at uh, the TV. Right it was right nothing. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> so, um, so talk a little bit about the budget. Uh, we've got... Uh, a, uh, a, a, an administration right now in the White House that uh, each year proposes pretty austere budgets. And I will say uh, that's not uh, completely out of the ordinary. Um, you know, even, you know, previous administrations would, would come to Congress with budgets that are, you know, less than robust with the understanding that Congress is going to increase it. The Trump administration's budgets have been a little bit more austere than that. They've, you know, recommended cutting lots of programs, eliminating agencies, um, both at Department of Transportation and uh, federal government wide. Thus far, Congress has pretty soundly in a really bipartisan way rejected those proposed cuts. Uh, and then in 2018 and 2019 fiscal years, we actually got uh, some pretty significant increases to transportation programs. We're hopeful uh, that that's going to happen again in 2019 and 2020, uh, but it's not a guarantee. Uh, a 2011 deficit reduction package that was approved by Congress, uh, again, 10 years ago, or almost 10 years ago, uh, set some very, very tight budget limits on, uh, on spending each year in order to get that, that $1.5 trillion in deficit reduction over 10 years. So now that we're in the 2020, we're in the last couple of years of it, it's, it's really taking its toll. Uh, and so Congress uh, for FY18 and 19 increased those budget caps, and as a result, we got increases in lots of programs. Uh, the president seems less likely to go along with an increase in the caps for 20 and 21 uh, easily. Uh, he, I think, is, has learned that this is, this is kind of leverage for him. Uh, and so we may see some budget battles for FY 2021 kind of go further into the fiscal year than we would prefer. Each fiscal year, uh, FY 2020 begins October 1, 2019. I can't imagine we're going to have a budget by then. Again, uh, I think that the President and Congress are going to be battling over these. So if, in fact, we get, you know, an increase in the caps, it's going to be great. We're going to get kind of, you know, uh, uh, increases for our programs once again. If not, uh, it could be kind of a 10% across the board cut for all federal agencies, not just, uh, not just transportation if we don't get uh, that budget agreement. So uh, the good thing about transportation is that uh, for the, at least for the formula programs at DOT, uh, we have some protection from those across the board cuts. The FAST Act guarantees these funding levels because of the uh, money coming from the uh, Federal Highway Gas Tax into the Federal Highway Trust Fund, uh, and so those would not be, uh, unless Congress specifically went and tried to cut them, uh, they, they would not, they wouldn't fall under an across-the-board cut. Programs like Amtrak, 
uh, New Start's rail projects at, D in DC, uh, at, at, F, uh, at DOT, the, the build slash tiger competitive grant program, those would be subject uh, to those cuts. Uh, the good news too is that uh, in FY19, uh, the, the STIC program, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys all are familiar with the STIC program, it's kind of our baby, right? Uh, it's kind of a bonus pool for, for high performing uh, transit agencies under, that serve uh, uh, populations under 200,000. Uh, and we were able to, in the 2015 FAST Act, get an increase uh, in that program. Uh, it kicked in in FY19, so that, that's now just starting to show up uh, in our budgets. Uh, and actually looking to increase it a little bit more in the 2020 FAST Act reauthorization. As a matter of fact, in the, probably in the next week or so, Congressman Panetta, along with uh, three other uh, members, is going to be a bipartisan bill to increase uh, that STIC. Basically, the STIC program is a takedown over the larger federal transit formula program. It's 2% of that. And then it goes into this, you know, creates this bonus pool. Uh, and we're trying to increase that to 3% of the uh, of the entire transit formula program. Sounds like a small amount, but this is, you know, this is a, a this is, you know, a $4 billion program uh, that we're talking about. So a 1% increase is not uh, small potatoes. It's so. over a million for us, Peter. Yeah, it's a, it's a big, it's a big deal. So Thanks. infrastructure. In 2016, uh, you know, after the president uh, was elected, there was a lot of talk about a big, beautiful trillion dollar infrastructure package, something that the Democrats and the Republicans could work together on. And um, so I, I got a little maudlin here, but uh, essentially, essentially an infrastructure package for the rest of this uh, administration is, is not going to happen. And I think that uh, unfortunately, um, the White House, I don't know if they were ever completely serious uh, about putting together a package. Uh, it it, it wasn't, wasn't one of their priorities, uh, you know, uh, immigration and uh, border security, uh, as well as uh, trade deals seem to be their legislative priorities and, and, uh, and infrastructure has been more, again, uh, sort of leverage. So, you know, you probably saw it in the news, but a couple of months ago, the president and, and Democrats in Congress got together and said, yeah, let's do a $2 trillion plan. We'll talk in a month and we'll, we'll see what happens uh, uh, as to how we put it together. They met a month later and the president insisted that uh, Congress stop investigating him and that Congress approve his Mexico-Canada trade agreement. Then we can talk infrastructure. Uh, Speaker Pelosi and uh, majority Le uh, minority leader Schumer uh, left the meeting and, and I think that's that. Uh, Structure. So, you tell um, us which had more impact: one of the many National Infrastructure Weeks or National Ice Cream Day? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, you know, it, it's been, it's a running joke in D.C. Uh, that every time something kind of blows up in a partisan way, everyone's like, "Well, there goes Infrastructure Week," and, uh, <laughs> because the the White House will often you know have these you know uh, these kind of public relations deals with a call it Infrastructure Week, and not not a lot behind it. So. Um, so yeah, so uh, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see much with regard to a, a major infrastructure package. But I will say that um, the last couple of years, we've gotten increases. There, there have been literally $10 billion per year in FY18 and 19 that were included in the individual budgets for existing programs for infrastructure. So that's there. And, and again, if, if, I were, if I were in Congress, I would be sort of touting that as a down payment on infrastructure. Um, we've got the FAST Act reauthorization coming in 2020, uh, and that's going to be a, a, a it's going to be a heavy lift uh, in order to keep funding levels the same because you know because uh, federal gas taxes are not coming into the Highway Trust Fund at a at a level that they used to. Just to keep programs the same over the five-year period from 2021 to 25 or 26, um, Congress is going to need to find 100 billion dollars in additional resources just to keep things the same. So, we, you know, of course we want growth. Uh, so that's probably going to need, uh, a, you know, an increase in the federal gas tax. Hasn't happened in 30 years. It's a tough political lift, uh, but, uh, you know, Congress is kind of running out of other options uh, to, to fund these things. Uh, and so, so that'll be a battle. Uh, and and we're, still, we're still battling that out in, in Congress. It's, uh, you know, the closer we get to an election, the tougher it is to, to do a tax increase or any tax increase. Uh, but but we do feel like that FAST Act in 2020 is going to be, at least for transit, it's going to be our infrastructure package. So again, the FAST Act expires in 2020. Uh, I, I will also say that 2021 at the earliest is when we'll actually see it uh, reauthorized. And uh, Congress tends to, again, on these funding issues, they tend to be pretty slow. 
Um, the last, um, the last before the 2015 FAST Act, there was the 2012 uh, reauthorization, and that was extended for short and long periods of time, over 30 times in three years before we got that 2015 FAST Act. So, so we're, it's 2021 is the earliest is when we're really going to see it. Uh, again, we're looking for both formula program increases and competitive program increases. We tend to do pretty well in these competitive programs at FTA, and so we want that pot to be uh, larger. Of course, I mentioned the stick program increase. Um, uh, throughout this, we have been participating in a, in a meaningful way in the American Public Transit Association reauthorization process. Uh, we want them to know our story and we want our policies to be included in theirs. Uh, and the CEO is very active in that process. I, uh, on the staff level, uh, are as, uh, am as well. And so, uh, and we will, we will keep that. Uh, and then again, like I said, you know, revenue, Re you know, it's all, <laughs> it's all about revenue now and finding that vehicle to really fund, uh, fund these programs. I don't think, you know, the, people talk about Oregon and their vehicle miles traveled pilot study and that may be kind of coming someplace. I don't think they're quite there yet. I don't think for this next reauthorization they will be year, there yet. Truthfully, the, the gas tax is really going to be our only way to go unless somebody finds something, you know, <laughs> under the cushions to, uh, to, to keep this thing going. So. Um, I think that was all I had, but I also did want to mention a couple of other things that I had not put up in the PowerPoint. And I'll, uh, but one was with regard to uh, tax issues. Of course, you guys probably know that we get a rebate. Uh, hopefully, we get a rebate every year from the IRS for our uh, purchases of compressed natural gas. It's called the Alternative Fuels Tax Credit. Unfortunately, Congress reauthorize or extends that really on an annual basis. So we have no certainty with regard to budgeting, and Angela hates me. Uh, because I can't provide her with certainty uh, on this thing. Um, and so we're hopeful that Congress, that by the end of this year, uh, will, uh, will extend that uh, alternative fuels tax credit. It'll have to be in a retroactive way, uh, and we're, but we're hoping that it can be kind of retroactive the last year and also push it forward a year uh, to provide us just a little bit of certainty. Uh, but that's been, a, that's been something that we deal with uh, every single year. Uh, and just as an aside, this tax credit is included in a big package of, you know, probably a couple of dozen very granular small tax breaks, mostly go to businesses. And some of them are kind of goofy, like there's a tax break for people who own NASCAR race car tracks and for people who have <laughs> horse tracks, you know, it's, it's, and so again, some of these are hard to swallow. And so Congress takes the big package of things like, a, like good stuff, like an alternative fields tax credit, and takes them all up in one package to, to make them easier to swallow. So, uh, so that, again, makes it, makes it more difficult for us. I think that the CEO and I have talked about talking to Congressman Panetta about maybe pulling out that alternative tax credit and having it go kind of on its own and seeing if Congress would have sort of approve that maybe on a permanent basis. Uh, and that's a, that's a political dance as well. But again, Congressman Panetta has been, been open to that. And then finally, uh, uh, Director McPherson mentioned this in, uh, this morning, but I also wanted to, uh, to mention with regard to uh, uh, receiving FHWA uh, uh, reimbursements for the, for the storm damages in, in the, done to the county roads in 2016 and 2017. Uh, the CEO uh, asked me if I would be helpful to the county in you know, sort of trying to advocate for that on, uh, on the federal level, and I'm, and I'm happy to do it and have been doing that with, with uh, county public works. It's a, you know, it's a tough climb. Uh, partisan gridlock has kind of prevented us from finding a, a legislative vehicle to get some relief for that. Congressman Woman Eshoo and Congressman Panetta and some other members of the California delegation are pushing FHWA really hard on this. Uh, but again, uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a policy change that seems to be uh, aimed just at California. And, uh, and so we're, you know, we're, we're, we're facing an uphill battle. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you again for your time. Any questions for Chris? Uh, Not Matthews. really a question, but uh, we met yesterday about city issues, and uh, uh, Chris brought up one point that was very interesting that was relevant, could be relevant to the Pacific Station project, and that had to do with opportunity zones. Um, 
I could try and repeat what you said, but maybe you could do it better. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And again, I've, I've spoken at length uh -huh. with the CEO. The 2017 tax bill uh, included a provision and created a new program called Opportunity Zones. And essentially what it does is it allows investors that have capital gains, if they, inv they, get, they, get, tax, uh, uh, they get tax breaks, if they invest those capital gains into designated Opportunity Zones. Uh, I think it was last year, the state designated some zones, and I believe there are two or three in Santa Cruz County, one uh, in uh, downtown Santa Cruz, uh, and so, and in Live Oak as well, right? And so, um, and so looking at that, the Opportunity Zones has become <coughs> kind of something that this administration is hanging its hat on. Uh, it's, it's still in its developmental stages. Investors are not yet, you know, jumping into this stuff. They're waiting for more um, waiting for more uh, guidance from the uh, IRS on it, uh, but uh, they are expressing interest in doing sort of investments, and so things like Pacific Station potentially downtown, that's a, a potential tool if there is an investor willing to kind of do something there and can get a, and can get a tax break from it. Uh, I will also say that, that uh, this administration has made um, communities with opportunity zones kind of priority uh, for competitive grant programs. So for instance, with the bus and bus facilities grant program, the build program at DOT, they are listed as, you know, a pr priority will be given to projects in opportunity zones. And so, uh, so I was mentioning yeah. to Director Matthews that if, you know, anytime you guys are doing a, uh, an, an application to the federal government for anything, and it might <laughs> impact opportunity zones, I would say cram that in there, uh, even if they don't ask for it. <laughs> and and that's what I got out of it. Although the uh, uh, IRS regs are still so murky that investors don't even know, apparently don't have the confidence to use that investment opportunity. The signal's been given even to federal agencies that haven't gotten increases in their budget. They've been given direction to uh, bump to the top of the list projects that are in an opportunity zone. So it it puts another star on your application. So that, that could be helpful to us. And we're just, we'll get to it later. But that, that was a really good insight to have. Oh, good information. Yeah. That's great. Any other questions? I, well, I, I guess it would also come down to um, knowing how cities could um, see if they qualify for that um, designation. Yeah, it was, a, it was a situation where Congress gave the uh, power to the states, each individual state, to d designate those. I believe uh, it was in 2018 yeah. that yeah. they were designated. Uh, and then again, uh, I believe there are three in Santa Cruz County total. Yeah, we had to submit uh, to the State Department of Finance, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, yeah, they were the ones. Uh, and then the governor put out the list, and then the, the feds adopted that list. Correct. But it's totally unclear. Still, what, what, what that means. Yeah. I mean, except, we, we just did it because. You get, except you get another point. I like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, hard, it's hard to figure out otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Any yeah. other questions? All right. I Chris? just want to oh. thank you for a fantastic yeah. job representing us in DC. He does a really good job for us, and we, the money we spend is well worth it. Thanks okay. very much. It's, good. Yeah, it's great I, to be I'd here. I'd second oh, that. And uh, it really, when we went gone back, I didn't go back this last year, but uh, or this year, but. Um, the way we have approached some things in the district here of being part of the solution, having a measure on the ballot and so forth to cover our, our deficient, our fi financial deficiencies, it was, it's recognized up there and it's in the heads of our, the representatives back in Washington, D.C., so it, uh, it helps. It does. Super. I remember, Director, we, we, got a, we got a nice lecture from Senator Feinstein a few years ago about, <laughs> <laughs> about exactly. things. <laughs> yes, and exactly. We, and we did it. Yep. Yeah. And, she's, and she's been acknowledged of that. She's acknowledged that. Right. And that, that was a selling point for Measure D, too. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Chris. That was a great presentation. I got a comment from the public, so I'm going to let them come up here. Thank you. Come on up. My name is Elise Casby, and I'm just uh, really interested in this. Um, kind of, there's a lot of talk about the Green New Deal, and I know that a lot of uh, different, you know, groups of people in the public interest have been going to D.C. and lobbying legislature uh, about the Green New Deal. And I wonder if uh, Chris, if you, I don't know your last name, so I'll just call you Chris. If Chris would mind um, telling us. Uh, if there's any promise that the Green New Deal will hold, um, will have uh, transportation funding as a major part of it, as I hope it would. So I'm just asking 
if they're for an update as far as that yeah, goes. We'll, we'll, Thank we'll you. see if he's got information. I don't know if he's prepared, but he might have something off the cuff. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, the, you know, the, the, the Green New Deal and climate change, uh, at least on the House side in, uh, in Congress, has been discussed uh, pretty, pretty deeply. There, there are two kind of, there's a, the Green New Deal right now is, is, is more of an idea than legislation. There's also a, a carbon tax uh, legislation that's, that, that is being floated around the House. I think that the House will consider uh, something with regard to climate change. Uh, I believe that there will be some sort of transportation element to it. I don't know what that's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be direct uh, infusion of funding or some sort of, um, you know, you know, or you know, on the other hand, something like SB 50. I don't, I don't know uh, what what it's going to take, but I know that transit uh, and transportation is is part of that equation. Um, the other side of this, sort of politically, right now, is um, as long as Republicans are are in charge of the Senate, uh, it won't go any further than the House. So uh, anything that does come up. This year will won't won't ha won't be enacted. It'll uh, it won't get to the Senate, and so the House is moving slowly on it because they've got a lot of new members who were just elected in Republican districts, and they don't necessarily want to make them take a really hard vote on oh. something that's not going to happen. So uh, so that's it's kind of where it is right now. Some dynamics, okay. Some well, dynamics. Well, we'll yeah. stay tuned on that. Okay. Certainly. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you for that. Okay. We're going to go ahead and uh, move on to the next item. This is uh, item 14, a public hearing for the final adoption of the Santa Cruz Metro budget. Angela. Welcome. Good morning. In the essence of time, and this will be the sixth time you've seen me up here with this, I think I can go to the details of changes versus the whole presentation, if that's suffice. That would be fine. All right. So today's presentation is on the FY20, FY21 operating budget and FY20 capital budget. We're going to be going over the five-year budget plan, all the revenues and expenses for 20 and 21, the operating side as well as the capital side. And then we have the additional information in here in this final version that we would be uh, producing in our final budget document that would be out to the public. So the five-year plan, um, we look like we have about $51 million in the expense side, but as you can see from this one, our revenues are um, on, on the good side. We always want our revenues above our expenses, so that's what the bar is going up. Revenues are above our expenses. This is the percentage of the revenues that we're getting in. Of course, our <coughs> biggest percentage is our sales tax, our, of the total two sales tax, and the second one is our passenger fares, and that includes the contracts that we have with UCSC Cabrillo and Highway 17. Going on to the expense side, as you can see, our expenses are lower than our revenues. That's the way we want it to be, $51 million in expenses versus $56 million in revenue. So here's the breakup of our expenses. Um, oh, my, category name. That's interesting. Um, okay, so the orange is supposed to be labor and fringe benefits for the bus operators at 35%. Uh, labor and fringe benefits, other is the blue at 40%, and the green is non-personnel expenses. The red is paratransit. Oh, there you go. Going on to the transfers. This is the uh, transfers. Um, we made this chart a little bit clearer. Everything that's red on the left-hand side is red on the pie chart on the right-hand side. So now you can more clearly see where the red money is going into the buckets on the right-hand side and the blue money is going into the buckets on, on the way right-hand side. Oh, dear. I am so sorry. You will have to go to page 14A.8 in your packet to see those uh, those changes. Um, apologize. I uh, thought we had this all together. But 14A.8 in your packet is the chart that I have up here now. So now you can see the different uh, names to those. Um, why, don't, why don't you read those names for the benefit of the audience? Okay. No, no, no. It's okay. So the, um, let's see what's missing up there. It looks at the chart. So the top uh, blue on the right is our biggest area, transfer to capital budget. This is the sales tax measure, and that's 39% of what's going into, out for the transfers in, out of the operating budget. The second largest is the uh, left-hand side of the red, transfer to operating capital reserve fund. This is the CalPERS, UAL, and the OPEP. 
And then the third largest one is the top red transfers access to operating capital reserve budget, and that's at about 18%. So those are the biggest, biggest uh, groups that we're transferring over. 2.5 blue, I'll just uh, pick that out, 2.4 to 2.5. That's the bus uh, commitment that the board has made of the $3 million that we we're putting in the capital budget every year. That's being transferred out of the operating budget, 2.4. And then we have an additional um, money going into the reserve the capital budget for the buses. <coughs> Sorry, a little confusing there. Moving on to the revenue expense percent change. This first one is the chart I've been showing you where it's the budget that we have going. Uh, the very high 10.3% that we had back in 2018, that's where we added Measure D and the STA, SBA, SD1 uh, dollar amounts. Now, uh, keep in mind, this is budget. Now, uh, this is what actually happened. So the actual, if you go over to 2018, you can see where our revenues came in, and we were able to fund totally fund our reserves in 2018. And our expenses were kept at 3.5%. So here's the changes between May and June's presentation. Uh, we are up on revenues by 80,000 in 2020 and about 26,000 in 2021. These are a swap of revenues. We had passenger fares in there for the, you know, the eco passes, and now we have a uh, contract that we're going forward with, and we believe we can get uh, additional revenues in those two years from going from the passenger fare to <coughs> the special transit fares of the eco pass contract. And as you can see on the slide here, it's a one year pilot program, and we're running it from October through September, starting this October. <coughs> On the operating expense side, our expenses are going up uh, between June and May of what I showed you, going up 193 in 2020 and 164 in 2021. Uh, the biggest piece of that is we're fully funding a uh, position in the purchasing area for the admin specialist pur purchasing for a provisional position. Additionally, we have our new marketing director that came in and she kind of needed some money to do her job, so we've added some money in there uh, for for marketing uh, starting in 2020-21. So the transfers, uh, $113,000 less is going into the transfers because of those at, uh, puts and takes on the revenue expense side and about $138,000 less is going into the transfers uh, in 2021. Looking at those reserve buckets, uh, this is our a guesstimate estimate um, as of June 14th when this is put together. If you go to page 14J1, you can see where the details are on this. Uh, we are fully funded in all of our buckets, uh, which is a good thing. And we now believe that we'll be able to put um, money into the operating and capital reserve bucket to bring it up to $8.3 million. This was at 2.3 in 2008. So these are non-controllable operating bu budget risks. You guys have seen this many, many times, so I'm not gonna go into each one. These are revenue risks. These are our expense risks. Next ones are the additional information that I've shown to you before. This is our board authorized support activities. This one's pretty small. This is our memberships, but all these details can be found in our budget. More memberships. Can't go there before you move on. Cynthia at an earlier meeting had suggested that we at least investigate the possibility of the Santa Cruz Business Council. Yeah. Could we do anything with that? Or We're uh, still investigating. I think Gina is hoping for a return call. She's left a couple messages. <laughs> well, then they won't get I any money. I don't understand that. <laughs> they won't get any money. If you can follow up on that. Follow. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Singleton, yeah. call's coming to you. Yeah. 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 FYI. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, Angela. All right. Here's the board member travel. Nothing's changed there from when I presented to you in May. Employee incentive program. That's what I presented to you in May also. So that's our operating side. Moving on to the capital budget for only 2020. This is our pie chart. 79% of our capital of the $20 million that we have going forward is for revenue vehicle purchases, replacements, and the campaigns that we do on them. Uh, next biggest area is your construction. Oh, no category names again. Apologize. So okay. the blue is revenue vehicle purchase replacement campaigns for $16.2 million. The orange is construction related projects at $2.4 million, which is 12% of our $20.4 million budget. 
and the rest of them are our normal IT projects, facility upgrades, maintenance upgrades, and non-revenue vehicles. Expand just briefly on the construction projects that are in this pie chart. So construction projects would be listed on page 14E1. And if we go to that, it will list out all the different capital projects that we have there and go on to the construction um, line item. The That's details does that answer your question? You. Okay. Well. On the budget side, this is the funding that we would be having for the um, capital budget. Again, the categories are missing, so let me find my chart. The orange is federal grants at $6.4 million. This is 31% of our capital uh, funding. The next largest one is the green on the top left. That's transfers from operating budget. This is the Measure D money that is coming out of the operating budget to fund um, the bus replacements. And then the blue is the next largest group, which is PTMISEA. Uh, that's at uh, $3.2 million, and that's 16% of our capital budget. The rest of them are um, STA money of 7.7 7 million, local partnership programs at 0.8, low carbon transit operations program, which is the LC top money at $1.6 million, and we have some uh, grant block money coming in at half a million dollars. That's all I had. So just as an additional, I didn't put a slide in here, but if you're interested in our unfunded capital, which is above and beyond the 20 million that we have here, that's on summary 14L.1. Five years, we have $45 million unfunded. 10 years, we have $209 million unfunded. And the details on 14L2-7. So that is my presentation. I just want to say that this presentation was completely done by my staff, and I'm just up here presenting it. Debbie and Christina are integral to everything that you see here. Thank you for that presentation, Director uh, McPherson. You were just about as fast as Josh, so uh, <laughs> I just I just wanted to make sure on which uh, orange the passenger fares. That's ten point four million, and that's steady throughout. Is that right? That was on fourteen A four. Is that right? Yeah, I just want to make sure that's the right. Let me double check. Oops. So passenger fares. If you go to fourteen B one, I'll have you look at our forecast here. I'm um, just looking at 14A4 yep. and you had it for the sort of... Yeah. Just trying to figure what color it is. Yeah, is oh, okay. 10.4? Yeah, 10.4 is our yeah. total, total passenger fares for 20. 10.4 uh, again in 21. Uh, looks like that's about what we're sticking at through the next five years for passenger fares. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up to the public. Welcome. Hello again. So I just wanted to step up and remind you that we are requesting that you hold off on any adoption for any budget, especially given with this presentation. We got three contracts that need to be ratified first. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? I, I am not able to follow uh, with information that I consider like really important. Um, I need to know what the management salaries are. I need to know what the consultant salaries are. I need to know how much the surveillance cameras that are going in are costing. I would like to know why drivers are unable to run from West one bus line to another. I went to take the 71 yesterday and it was eight minutes late and I was late for my doctor's appointment at Dominican. Um, and I don't think it's the drivers. I think the problem here is that the drivers are being asked to, to do too much. We had a bunch of bus lines that were cut to some of the most poorest um, neighborhoods that are in the mountains. 
I need, I really need for, uh, for there to be a less kind of bureaucratic business as usual type meeting. And I wanna see really hard questions being asked. Obviously we're, we're operating in a period where there's very little federal um, funding coming in, but I feel like there's been this gradual um, buildup of, of uh, management and um, IT information and slick promotions and I'm just a bus rider and I'm just seeing less and less service since Alex Clifford came on board as CEO. I'm seeing more um, presentations by slick consultants and when we do have public information meetings, they're usually very one-sided, where all the information is being sort of presented to the public, and we're sort of slotted in to, to fill out, you know, give our comments on it instead of real public dialogue. So I just wanna say it's, it's getting more and more difficult for me to go to all the various meetings that I need to go to just to try to understand public life and government life I was at at something last na night that went late. And I would really appreciate it if if we could have a more easy to follow presentation on, on what the impacts are for the public and the ridership and not pie charts that have no names on them, which to be honest, to be honest with you, I find this kind of presentation very bureaucratic and not very much in the public interest to begin with. I feel like I'm at some kind of bank meeting where what I'm hearing about is all about money, money, finance, money, 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 money. And I've, I, I just don't hear enough about what's happening to the actual buses for the public. So I just wanted to say that um, I'm somebody who's interested, but I'll be honest, it gets hard to maintain interest when you come to meetings where you feel it's like you're at some kind of golf club meeting and everybody's friends with each other and the presentations are so like, just completely, it's like reading a f somebody's financial statement. I realize that's important, but I feel like there's a whole dimension that's missing. Thank, thank you, and I do. <laughs> and I do apologize for the pie, pie charts, and I'm sure that we'll make sure that that doesn't happen again. So thank you for the comment. Thank you. Go ahead. With all due respect, every question that the la last speaker from the public uh, at least raised is public information easily accessible in our budget. We don't have a complicated, hard to read budget. And if you want to come to a meeting, please, your you're, you're three minutes are done. You know what, just Excuse you do this me. all the time. I give information and all you do is totally counter it. And thank you very much because it illustrates exactly what I'm talking about. I will go on with my right to respond, which is, Every one of those questions are very reasonable questions. How much does management make? Um, I mean, I won't repeat them all. They're all accessible. I'm happy to sit down with any member of the public, as is our management staff, and present the information. So somebody wants to come to a meeting and argue against the way we spend our money, they have every right to do so. I appreciate people that are interested in that level of engagement. And uh, perhaps, you know, more to the point, this is our budget discussion. Sure, it sounds like there's lots of numbers and dollars. That's what we're doing right now. We have other agenda items where we talk about the other issues. So I, I really respect people who want to understand how to get involved in the public process and make political comments or whatever kinds of comments about the priorities that we're making. But you can't come here and attack us. I don't, you can, you have a right to say anything you want, but it's not helpful to come and attack us because we're talking about numbers in our budget and asking for information that's easily accessible to the public. It would take 15 minutes to get that information out in the meeting. It should happen before the meeting. And then, and if people wanna have that kind of, you know, specific information, they can get it. It's not hidden. Thank you. Did someone else want to speak? Yeah, come on up. Hi, Vicki Trent again, just real briefly. I noticed in the enabling statute for this public agency that the general manager is referred to in those terms very specifically, those two words, general manager, that term comes up again and again and again in the enabling statute <coughs> in the Public Utilities Code. I'm wondering what the perception is of a CEO, chief executive officer versus general manager. It concerns me because the idea of a CEO sounds like an inflated salary each year sounds almost like taking advantage of the position. I think it would be better for everybody to go back to the term general manager to refer to Mr. Clifford. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? 
Okay, we'll go ahead and close the public I, hearing. I did want to make one more comment, similar to Mike's, if I could. I'm just going to close the public hearing. Yeah. 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 I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back for discussion. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, if all we had to make decisions on was the brief presentations here with some charts and a, a summary presentation, we'd be hard pressed to do it. And um, obviously, we all have a lot of information uh, and very full and complete staff reports for every single item on the agenda. And Elise is familiar with that. She's she comes regularly to the city council. So and the the transit metro agenda and all the reports are also equally available to the public. So uh, every one of these is is uh, readily researchable. Just want to state that that for the record. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Appreciate that, Mr. Clifford. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to add, uh, this board a few years back created standing committees, and this budget has been through the Budget and Finance Standing Committee, I think no less than three times. That Those are public meetings. They're publicized on our website, and uh, we welcome the public to participate in those meetings, too. And that the standing committees are oftentimes the place in which the board members take extra <laughs> time to dig into the details of the budget and to ask tough questions. I can vouch for that. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes. Mr. I'd Mr. also like to further emphasize uh, Vice Chair Rotkin's point that um, I'm I'm not a politician. I am an elected official. Um, I study plants. I'm a scientist. My interests are in sustainability, and transportation happens to be one of my favorite parts of that. Um, in terms of fiscal knowledge, budgets, finances, all that stuff, I have no idea. But the public accessibility of this information has been a great aid in enabling me to perform my duties in my ex officio position. So, yes, it is accessible to the public, and certainly if I could do it, then anyone could. Well, <laughs> that was a very valuable <laughs> comment. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rodkin. Um, I, I wanted to, before we got started uh, in the, any detailed discussion of the budget, uh, at least one, if not both, of the unions asked us to put off the budget because we're still in bargaining. I want to say that, you know, you can always amend the budget during the year. It's not done lightly, but doing the budget gives us an idea of what our variety of needs are across the entire spectrum of possibilities. So the whereas um, the budget now may or may not provide uh, su sufficient funding for what the unions are hoping to get or what they're uh, bargaining for, it's not impossible for us to make amendments if we end up with a bargaining agreement that doesn't quite fit into this budget. As I said, it wouldn't be done lightly, but then we're not going to enter into a contract with three, you know, with uh, the, the unions lightly either. It's going to be a difficult issue. We're in the middle of bargaining. So I don't think we need to put off this budget. I think we need to have, know where we're basically planning to go. And if it turns out we make a settlement that requires us to modify one of our items here and stuff, we have the legal capacity to do that. Thank you for that insight. We have a uh, item on the uh, agenda. Discussion. I'll approval of the budget proposal from staff at this point. Second. I have a motion by Rod, can approval by Matthews. Any other discussion on the budget? Uh, I'll just say that um, this budget hasn't been taken lightly. Uh, the committee has met. We have gone through it extensively and done a lot of grilling of the staff. And I do appreciate their time in putting up with us on those tech <laughs> questions. Um, I think that we have some real serious issues, some fiscal issues that we will be addressing in the near future. And we need to be able to protect the right of keeping this agency alive as a result of the fiscal impact that we can expect. Um, our retirement and a lot of things that go into it, it isn't just the dollar wage, it's the impact exponentially of the benefits along with the dollar wage that we're having to really balance on a very, very fine um, tipping point of what we can do versus what we're already obligated to do based on um, history and um, cost of living and uh, cost of the uh, equipment and capital that are needed here. So I just want to let you know that uh, it, it's very complex. So just coming up here, listening to a presentation and I uh, and saying a or yes or no on this is it goes well beyond that. So we just want to make sure the public is aware that a lot of that uh, information uh, it's encouraged to show up to some of these committees where there is a lot more conversation, dialogue, um, and and questions that are given that um, we don't have the quite so much liberty and time at this particular level to um, address. So just letting you all know that it's important that we all are on the same page about that when, when it comes to a vote and that 
again, I agree that there's ample opportunity to reach out. Uh, you've got contact information for the people here. Um, the public is invited or is eligible to attend any of this. The information is then um, put back on the public of what the past history is for items that have come for individual votes. So all of that is accessible, available, and um, we're, we're all making sure that we're all um, inclusive and getting as much information out there at the level of what the comprehension is of the, the person that's in the audience or the, the people that are here on our, our board um, that are voting. Thank you. Thank you. Director Leopold. Um, I'm going to be supporting the motion. I, I just want to say that our, our budget this year looks better than it did uh, uh, several years ago. Um, and everyone in this agency made uh, an outstanding effort to get us through a very difficult time. Our drivers did a lot. Uh, uh, the other employees, our management staff, uh, and the public strongly supported the agency. Um, and we're in the middle of negotiations, but we remember all those pieces as we, uh, as we pass this budget and talk about all the other pieces that have to go in terms of negotiation. Um, we're, we're never out of the woods as a public agency, um, <clears throat> and we're gonna, we have to continue to think about that, <clears throat> but we also remember what makes the agency um, successful, and it's the employees and our relationship with the public. Thank you. Any other comments? Be before I call for the vote, I just want to make it clear that every board member that's up here understands, and the reason we're here is for the well-being and the sustaining ability of Metro. That's what we do. That's what we're here for. So with that, I'm going to call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. That budget carries unanimously. Okay, it takes us to our next item, which is the CEO's oral report. Mr. Clifford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Directors, I'll keep this brief. Uh, just starting off with the uh, New hires, we have uh, Jess Martinez that we hired, Virginia Vaquero Casey, administrative assistant. Um, I'm gonna double back to Rufus in a minute. Um, we had promotions uh, th in this uh, last month uh, from mechanic one to mechanic two, Miguel Villarreal and Christopher Perez. And I'd like to just introduce you also to Rufus Francis. I'll read his brief bio and if we can invite him up to the podium, maybe he can give a couple of remarks when I'm done. Rufus joined Santa Cruz Metro effective Jill, uh, June 24th as a safety, security, and risk director. Uh, Rufus has worked in various large metropolitan transit systems in California in a senior management level for over 30 years. Rufus attended the California State University Los Angeles and obtained a master's degree in health and science. He also has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and an associate degree in civil engineering. In addition, he's earned several courses in transportation management, transportation engineering, and safety from UC Irvine, UCLA, and Cal State Los Angeles. Over his career, Rufus has served on seven major transit cooperative research sponsored programs sponsored by um, TRB, Transportation Research Board. He also served on the APTA Board of Directors for two terms and the California Transit Association Subcommittee Chair of the Rail Operations and Regulatory Committee for two terms. It is really a pleasure to introduce you to Rufus. He was a great find for us. I think he'll do great things for us. And Rufus, would you mind coming on up and Come on up, Rufus. introducing yourself and maybe saying a couple of words? Quite a resume. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clifford. And I'm so glad and honored to be over here. As You've heard I've been in the transit for over 30 years. Started my career with MTA Los Angeles. It used to be RTD. Then became LSE, LSE MTA, then LA Metro, then Sacramento Regional Transit, and then UTA, and finally here. So I'm very happy, and I'll try my best to serve this organization in the safety, security, and risk management areas. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Welcome to Metro. Yeah. Chair, that concludes my presentation. Any questions of the CEO? Okay, we'll move on to, uh, we have a report of the uh, uh, MAC uh, committee from Veronica Elsie. Uh, uh, oh, uh, 17. Um, Alex, uh, were you going to do an update on the Pacific Station at this point? Uh, 
Yes, I, I was just going to give a couple of brief remarks. I know we chatted just before. Beryl, hold on a second. We're going to. Do you want me to double back after the? Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to yeah. that after, after we get the SMAC report. Thank you. Yeah. You got it. Welcome, Veronica. Thank you. I'm going to get myself. Okay. Ricotta, down. <laughs> down. Yeah, you guys didn't get to hear the, miss the uh, perfectly placed whining that was going on <laughs> under my <laughs> under my feet. Um, good girl. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Veronica Elzey, and I am serving as the 2019 chair of your Metro Advisory Committee. And I am pleased to have this slot to be able to update you on how we are functioning what we're doing and what we would like to share with you. First of all, I would like to say that it's been a very well-functioning committee. Attendance continues to be good. We have a committee full of thinkers, questioners. Uh, already, I've got probably three times as many items suggested to me as I will be able to fit on our remaining agendas for 2019. Um, so it's a very active group and we really take our um, positions quite seriously in representing the community and in helping all of you to just maybe share different perspectives and make Metro work better. Uh, so I wanna start by talking about the things that we have done. Um, and first, I would like to say that our committee did receive an excellent presentation on the budget in April. So there is another opportunity for the public to come ask questions. Um, it was in our packet and we had a lot of good questions come from our committee members. They do appreciate these opportunities and hopefully our information and our questions come back to you guys and help you draft a better budget. We really appreciate the regular service planning updates that we received. And I wanna take this time to really publicly commend Barrow because when we present questions and we discuss why can't Metro go here, uh, we're a little concerned about this part of UCSC not being served or here's what's going on at Cabrillo at night. Honestly, the next meeting that we have, Barrow comes in with our list of questions and he'll say, you asked blah, blah, blah. The answer is blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And we really feel heard respected and feel like our information there has been adequately and wisely used to help work on your service updates and your planning as you go along. So I really wanna make sure the board understands that because it's been, it's been really good. Um, the other area which has probably been mentioned here before but I wanna emphasize it again is the participation that we had on the um, implementation of your code of conduct that you've been generating. We really appreciate that you took our comments and concerns seriously and we saw them reflected in the final version of that code and we really appreciate the fact that you made good use of us as an advisory committee because we really do want to serve that function, not just to be a committee that's advised, but a committee that advises you just from the wisdom that we have of being writers with slightly different perspectives. And we are hoping that we will have continued involvement in the implementation of the code, how we inform the public of its existence just so that people know um, and that we're looking forward to continuing to do that. We've had some effect on covering questions about the Watsonville Customer Service Center, where there had been some concerns about making, making that work well, and we've seen some responses to that also. Um, we, I'd already mentioned the, the Cabrillo and UCSC services. Some of the things that we are looking forward to working with you on can, that are coming up 
are the um, fair restructuring um, that might happen soon, the continuing progress of the intelligent transportation system. We really want to make sure to work with you that to make sure that any apps or anything related to it is accessible to all of your writers. Um, our challenge as a committee is the fact that we only meet quarterly. And sometimes we can get surprised by things that happen in between our meetings or by the fact that we set our calendar at the beginning of the year and then something will come up and we're so oh, darn, why didn't we have this quarter's meeting in the second month, but we were trying to make ourselves available for the budget. So one of the things, just as an example, that got us this year was the um, closing of some bus stops and the removal of the benches. And the trouble is that when an article comes out and the public hears about it, they do kind of know that we exist, so we get an earful. Why didn't you catch it? Why didn't you catch it? And you know, we could present you with some things that just maybe hadn't been considered too much, like when a bus bench suddenly disappears, some of us have, you know, oh no, my dog's gonna end up in therapy. Find seat, find a seat. Oh wait, where is it? It's gone. Find it, where is it? Where, you know? So um, outreach to the public is something where we can really be an asset to you and kind of help organize things to minimize surprises. Things like the, the closure of the information booth at the Pacific Station. We had a lot of comments on that because many of us were quite, wait, where'd it go? Where'd we go? Where'd it go? <laughs> so, so again, this is just something that you can really use your, um, your committee. And we have actually had some good comments from members of the public, some of them quite similar to what you heard this morning. So I'd like to continue to remind any members of the public that our meetings are open, our schedule is published, and anyone is welcome to attend. And, and in fact, um, for the members of the public, it's just about to close the next round of recruiting for two new members. So if you feel inspired today, you still got time to put in your application. And it's really nice to have a full committee and I would like to close by thanking the two members who have moved on, not because they were displeased with our committee or got bored, but only because they moved out of Santa Cruz, uh, one out of state. So I would like to thank Kevin Andrews and Cassidy Mega for their service and their time on the committee. It was great having the perspective of some younger writers and I look forward to how we can assist you as a board. Please remember that we're here. Make use of us because we're all trying to get to a metro that does work for everyone and get information out there so that everyone knows exactly what's happening. Any questions? Thank you, Veronica, for that uh, presentation. Uh, Director Matthews. It's not a question. I just want to thank you. Um, it's, it's wonderful to hear your report. I know you've got a lot of experience on committees. <laughs> that we yeah, work together. <laughs> um, uh, and you really do, you and the committee, fill that valuable function of being truly advisory. I read the minutes. The, obviously, they're informed, dedicated, and diverse members on the committee, and that's what makes it useful. So I just want to thank you collectively. And I know um, Cassidy, who moved on, is going off to graduate school. Um, was was so happy to have that representing Cabrillo that experience. In she did an excellent yeah. job at it too. Yeah. She really did. I'm 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 hoping somebody else fills those shoes. Yeah. Um. Anyway, thank you all. I just want to say that. <laughs> any, any other comments or questions? I would Dr. just Myers. like to. I'm uh, a new director or a new board member, and uh, I just want to thank you so much for such a thorough report. It's really helpful for me to really understand the work of the MAC, and uh, I just appreciate your report and uh, all your comments today. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to do it, and I will come back in December. And, you know, we, we've had nice reports from many of your staff. We, we took a little study and looked at the, um, you know, how things were going with Paracruz for its on-time report, and just little things like that that we have the time to do that we can assist with so that we can come up with suggestions that might help. So thank you very much. Okay.
Thank you, Veronica. I just want to say from the chair position, thank you for your leadership and your commitment. We all appreciate it. Thank well, you. Thank you. What are you wagging about? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it takes us to our, our next item. This is an introduction of leadership Santa Cruz graduates. Mr. Cliff. Oh, the Pacific Station. Oh, that's right, the Pacific, Pacific Station, Station update. Yeah. Sure, uh, Mr. Chair, directors, uh, this is not on your agenda, but I'll cover it under CEO oral report for as long as I can until legal counsel cuts me off. Um, it's not an action item, so just a quick report, which is that we have met a couple of times now with uh, representatives from the city of Santa Cruz and talked about the path forward. Barrow has designed uh, sort of a couple of timelines for us to look at. Um, we're also proceeding with sort of that final look at the bus tarmac concept. You might recall when we presented that to you before, we said we think this can work from a very high level, but now we need to get down to a little bit more detail level and make sure that you can get the right number of bus bays out of the plan. But maybe more important to the city, um, the design of that bus tarmac also heavily influences what's left over for commercial retail housing on Pacific Avenue. And the city's made clear if that uh, results in too narrow of a building, then it just won't be economically feasible to proceed in that direction. So this is a really important step to understand what, what will fit on that property <coughs> and what's left over for commercial retail on Pacific Avenue. Um, we're going to try to move in the, the next couple of months towards uh, understanding what we need to put together for grant applications, which I believe is Barrow are due in February. There you go, what you just heard from Barrow. So we're trying to get those uh, in good order, and uh, we've also talked to the city about uh, uh, other funding opportunities. The city has mentioned uh, CDBG, Community De Development Bro Block Grant Program monies, maybe the possibility of multi-year funding through that program, just conceptually anyway at this point. Um, and and uh, we've looked at the opportunity zone. Uh, we'll continue to explore that. And the city brought in a consultant that talked about lease leaseback. I won't go into that. It's a rather complicated concept, but it may also lend itself to some value to this particular uh, project. So moving forward, lots of good mm -hmm. discussions. Um, some targets, a timeline that we're hoping to achieve to minimally hit those two grant opportunities. And I'll, I'll just add, uh, Donna and I had a long conversation with Bonnie yesterday afternoon just to get her update on it. Um, Bonnie, Bonnie Lipscomb is the head of the city's economic development department, which is the lead agency for the city in this partnership. Um, they are actually submitting um, a grant application today f to um, Department of Toxic Substance Control uh, to do some further um, site characterization of the site. Uh, that application's going in. If they're successful, then that can open up some additional grants. So uh, she's working full time on trying to hit these benchmarks for decision making. We, we realize there's a whole series of them. Um, so, uh, and I just prepared something that I shared with Alex, uh, if anyone else is interesting interested and in, uh, Barrow I'd like to get your overlay <laughs> and um, it's something it's it's such a critical decision for me personally I think I'd like to have not deep reports but regular updates on on what are we hitting what are the snags etc and I also Bonnie also mentioned some of you may not know that uh, the city um, purchased a couple years ago the um, building adjacent to Metro the NIAC building um, and they are building new offices out on the west side. Uh, the city owns that building. Uh, NIAC expects to m move out of the building in December, and it's a good functional building. So um, that could be available as an interim site. I'm just mentioning it. I, I think maybe you haven't even heard this news, but um, anyway, that's, that's just one more um, possibility to throw in the mix of how things could be jiggled. So I'm just, I'm just bringing in board members up to date. Um, it's, it is one of these um, ambitious projects that uh, will take a lot of coordination, but um, anyway, that, that's... I just wanted to keep you, you sort of cut yourself off interim site, that office wouldn't be used well, let's say, site. Let's just say hypothetically that we decided to pursue um, a new cooperative project 
but the existing offices are in really bad shape. I see. The, the, uh, the existing offices could be mothballed. NIAC is a perfectly functional building. <laughs> and in fact, one of the other partners um, in the, the larger site plan could also occupy another part. I mean, it, that's a... Yeah, I'm just trying to not get our attorney to look at me like we're no. getting too far into a non agenda item. I understand, okay, and so it's all uh, information, not asking for a single bit of right. action. But um, I do think it deserves uh, uh, somewhat regular update reports. We can see to that. I'm done. Yeah, um, <laughs> this is uh, this is a non uh, a voting item and uh, uh, whatnot. But we had uh, that commercial bus service that was coming up from the campuses and using that particular location. Do you have any? Is it working? Is it not working? Have we seen them come through and use our station there? Do any any knowledge of anything with that activity? It's the Flix contract. I believe so. Did. Yes. I'll let Cyril speak to that, but I think they've been quiet and have not started service. Zero, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, there yeah. hasn't been very much movement. Oh, by the way, Cyril, with your COO. Um, there hasn't been very much movement from Flix. Uh, originally, when we went forward and had the presentation in which you authorized the use of Pacific Station for their stop, they indicated to me that they were still in the planning stages for their routing and that it would be some months uh, later. They just wanted to ensure that they would have a place to go when they completed that study. That's where they're at, basically. Did they give you an idea of coming back or? Uh, not recently. I sent an email to the uh, director. I have not heard anything back from her, but uh, I intend to uh, refresh that email. And we're not receiving any funds until they actually start the activity. Is that correct? They're not like taking a block lease, even though they're not really actively using it until they've got everything squared away? It was agreed to that it would be per stop. All right. So it's a revenue stream potential that's just not ready yet. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, stepping back just a little bit about the Pacific Station uh, business, I know that um, I wholeheartedly agree with Director Matthews that the student body would be heavily impacted by any sort of major change or renovation of Pacific Station that regular public updates, I think, would be crucial, even if small and incremental. Mm -hmm. Okay. That message has been delivered. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we'll go ahead and move on to item 17, which is uh, Introduction to Leadership, Santa Cruz Graduates. Mr. Cliff. Yes, um, as you know, uh, Mr. Chair and Directors, the, annually um, we are fortunate to be able to designate employees, I think up to four employees that we can put uh, forward as nominees to the leadership program. And uh, what I'd like to do is invite a Leadership Santa Cruz program. I'd like to invite uh, Don Creme, uh, Freddie Roca, and Gina Pai, maybe up to the front microphone just to acknowledge that they, they were our candidates who completed the program this year. And maybe they could just share a couple of little nuggets about the program and why it might be of value to continue in that process. Good morning, Don Creme, HR Director. Um, I apologize for my jeans. I spilled cranberry juice all over my tan slacks on my way over the hill this morning. Um, yeah, but I do want to just say that this was an awesome program, especially for me. Um, I'm from Santa Clara County, so I knew very little about Santa Cruz County. So just to learn about the agriculture, the, the, um, the housing, the crime, the everything, it was just a tremendous uh, gain for myself. It also opened up a door for me to meet um, several individuals throughout the county that I can connect with. Um, I've done some recruiting efforts with them already. Um, we've kind of hung out outside of class just to get to know each other better. So it was very beneficial to me. So I'm very thankful for that opportunity. Thanks. I'm kind of the same way. It was, uh, I, I'm originally from this area. I'm actually from uh, uh, Watsonville area. But uh, it was very beneficial for me, just the people that I met, the people that I was able to talk to, uh, all these connections that we made. Uh, uh, per personally, on my, my, my point of view, it's, um, it's going to help me a lot to get a lot of pro projects or stuff that we have going on in the county because now I know who to, hey, can mm -hmm. you get, I, I've been trying to get a hold of this guy and he's not answering my call. Can you help me out there? You know, you guys know that those are the most helpful things that we get out of it. Somebody personally that can help push something along. So, so like I said, that for me, that was the most helpful. And then understanding so much of, of the county, um, it just, uh, it's in, in tremendously 
good program. Thank you for that. Go ahead. Gina. I think that would be great. Yeah, great. And maybe while she's up there, so you can make a few comments. This is marketing at work. Yeah. yeah. Check your background. Yeah. Thank you. I think that everybody that's going through a leadership uh, <laughs> class from all of our cities has been a wonderful experience. So you were able to share that. The networking possibilities are endless. So endless, endless, endless. endless. So y'all know I'm kind of like from this area off and on throughout my whole life. But it was really interesting to see some of the stuff that I hadn't actually seen in detail. Like, I know the agriculture is there. I know the boardwalk is there. I know all these things are there. But I'd never been there, like, as a person. So it was really cool. Yeah. Could have done great. without some of the agriculture and some of the allergies that went along oh, with it. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. And what was really interesting, yeah, I think, was how the agriculture is moving away from using so much water. Mm -hmm. It was so cool, the technology yeah. that they're employing. Yeah. And the technology that's being used. Well, that's everywhere. good for all of us because we have very little of it. So, yeah. 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 Well, so good. thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you all for attending. Thanks we appreciate for representing it. us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, that brings us to our last item. This is a review of items to be discussed in closed session. Julie. Well, it's no surprise. We're talking about our labor negotiations, and you know we put on the agenda ratification. We obviously didn't get there. We wanted to be optimistic. So when we come out, we won't be taking, we won't be reporting any action. Nothing to report out. Okay, great for that. Okay, just want to make an announcement. Uh, our, our next meeting will be, uh, will be have no meeting in July. Our meeting will be August 23rd at, at 9 a.m. at Metro offices. And prior to that, does anybody would like to speak to us on an item in closed session before we go into closed session? Hello again. So I did want to acknowledge the fact that you guys did shut off the timer to really listen to what we had to say. And um, when I met with every one of you when I first came onto this position, the most consistent message I heard from each and every one of you was, you understand it's time to give us what we deserve. And if you truly believe that, it's time for you to step in and make this right. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else speak to us? Okay, with that, we will adjourn to closed session. Thank you.